Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're diving into a brand new adventure. My Huntsman Academia, huge shout out to the amazing author. Check out their details in the description below. Want to follow along? The link's right there for you. In this session, we'll be exploring chapters 1 of 3. Don't forget to smash that like button and drop a comment. Your engagement helps us out with the algorithm and means the world to us. All right, let's jump into the story. Long ago, two brothers of light and dark shaped the world of Remnant, both for good and for ill. All things were connected to this balance of creation and destruction between the two, most of all their joint creation, humanity. When the moon shattered, this force echoed throughout the realms of the brothers' creations and, too, shattered them. This old legend is considered to be early man's explanation for the phenomena in persons where, in a select group of the population, a person is incapable of manifesting their aura, while no longer as commonly seen or as devastating to one's social standing as it was in the day when most humans had their auras unlocked, it is still considered an odd and somewhat embarrassing condition to be known to have. To be born of the moon, or flat out broken if you want to be crude, is the colloquialism used to describe it. Sorry kid, it's not gonna happen. I'm the one to blame. Do you really think they'd let someone broken like you in when they've got me? He's the coolest in the universe. Most grim can't be beat unless you have aura. So no, I honestly don't think you can become a huntsman without it. Kaken. I'm sorry, Edzuku. I wish things could be different. Young man, you too can become a hero. Oh wow, he must have dozed off. As he shook his head to force himself awake, he thought it was weird that the other prospective students milling about and the airship's engines hadn't managed to keep him from falling asleep. Izuku Midoriya yawned as quietly as he could so as not to draw too much attention to himself while he tiredly rubbed at his eyes. He didn't get much sleep last night. I mean really, how could he? Ten long months of training had left him pretty much sore to the last inch of his bones. Heck, he was and is still surprised that he'd found any sort of comfortable position to sleep in the night before with how badly he stung all over. New aura notwithstanding. That was the point of the entire training though. What made it necessary he supposed. He'd been born of the moon, born without the capability of producing an aura, and so needed to train his body in preparation for it. Now though, now it was a different picture. Now, he felt his aura rushing through him, relieving the tension through his body and somehow easing his poor muscles. Of course, this was only possible because of the strange semblance he had so recently received. Izuku smiled warmly. Thinking of his semblance only brought his attention back to the man who had given it to him. Tashinori Yagi the greatest huntsman alive, who had ever lived, and who ever might live. The symbol of peace and hope whose fearless smile inspired anyone who saw it and banished the negative emotions the grim fed upon. Izuku's hero, the man he'd met just ten short months ago, and who had helped make Izuku's dreams possible. Yeah, at first he pretty much crushed his hopes and dreams into a fine powder with such efficiency that even his own mother's previous attempts now seemed lackluster, but well, he was being honest with what he thought at that moment. When he saw what Izuku was capable of, okay, not capable of but willing to do, Tashinori had taken him under his wing. That hard work, ten months of hell, had all been geared to make Izuku into the huntsman that the young man had wanted to be, a hero who could save people and lift their spirits just by smiling. Because of whatever faith his hero had in him, he worked Izuku to the bone to ensure he'd finally see his dreams come true. He stared down his fist, playing with his fingers as her again felt the wonder of his aura wax and wane, or almost come true. The rest really was up to Izuku now. If he didn't impress at the initiation, he was going to let him down. Like, really let him down. It seemed like he had a lot of hopes as it concerned his own legacy pinned on him. Okay, so maybe it wasn't just the sore muscles that had kept him up last night. The expectations, the important legacy that Izuku now had to support through his own efforts, they kind of piled up, forming a boulder that had felt like it was about to crush Izuku's chest. What if he failed? What if he embarrassed himself completely? Would Tashinori still care about him? After all, what was the point of him having faith in Izuku if the green-haired young man was just going to screw it up? He sighed and thrust his arms out in a stretch, and almost let out a pained yelp as he felt a small pop in his left arm. He was still in awe of how sore he was. Still, the pain was a good way of snapping him out of his own nervous thoughts to give him a moment to think. Though to be honest, he didn't know what to think really. Of course he was this sore, of course his body ached this badly. That was just how it was going to be, right? He hadn't been born normal, hadn't been born with the capacity to do what every other person on this ship could do. 
He had had to work this hard just to deserve a chance at seeing his dream come true. That 10 months was just enough for me to get where I needed to be to inherit his semblance, and it was hell. This really isn't going to be easy. Still, I rose up to the challenge before, right? This was my dream I'm working for, and finally, I have a chance at it. Even if it's going to be hard. Even if it means that I had to work three times harder than anyone else to succeed. If that's what it takes, I'll do it. I'm gonna be a hero. A smile ran across his face, a giddiness overcoming him. His hard work was what brought him here. And it'd be his hard work that would keep him moving forward. At least, that had been how Tashinori had put it. Young Midoriya, someone once told me that there is a difference between being lucky and being deserving. The first is an accident, the other a reward. Never get the two confused. Though honestly, Izuku thought he was pretty darn lucky to be here anyway. After all, that was the best word to describe being taken under Tashinori's wing in the first place. Now he just had to make sure he was deserving, and he would, no matter how much hard work he had to put into it. H.I.'s excitement had almost got the best of him as his right leg kicked out a bit, threatening to topple over one of his cases. With a bit of a panic jerk he reached over and kept it from falling over, sighing in slight relief. Two cases and a bag. These contained his worldly possessions now. It had been so weird to just pack everything up from his little room in his family's apartment and see, save for most of the posters, furniture and toys that he decided he wasn't going to bring along, how little he actually owned. Some workout clothes, some normal change of clothes and his notebooks, huntsman analysis for the future and grim analysis for the future. Add in some toiletries and basic necessities that his mother had made sure he wasn't going to go without, and that had been about it for the bag and the suitcase. But that had left the other suitcase. Hizuka patted it slightly as he nodded. While he was working out and making sure he passed well enough at your combat school, he didn't have much of a time for a job. He had got some help when it came to the other gear that he'd be expected to have, at least in part, going to the most prestigious hunter academies in all of Remnant. For the rest, well, his family wasn't doing too bad for itself, between his mom and dad. Heck, Izuku had grown up with his own computer in the apartment. Between his own allowance and what his mom had been willing to kick in, he'd been able to put something together when he'd first gone to his primary combat school, Birch Academy. Tashinori's image had been so set in Izuku's mind when he started combat school that he had done everything to model himself on the hero. In particular, he had been inspired by Tashinori's smashes, said to rip Grimm to shreds even when he missed by the wind generated by the strike. Izuku, however, knew this was false. Tashinori never missed. But in order for a kid without an aura to reproduce something like that, he'd have to take a little roundabout way to get that kind of power. Of course, now he had one for all. The semblance that Tashinori had passed down to him that had made this all possible, so the point had been made somewhat moot. Still, he cracked open the case and rubbed his hand over the weapon. Unfolded, they were pretty simple. Armored gloves with thick bracers that, from certain angles, it could be told what they were covering up. There was a handle that was pulled into the bracer as well that, as part of its mecha shift, he'd grabbed to help control the pace and rhythm of the pump shotguns he had attached to these weapons. Sure, the setup made doing any kind of complex tasks with his hands nearly impossible, but all Izuku had to do in that case was mecha shift them back into their bracers. The boots were even more simple. Safeties were set up in the heels that he could trip to let the shotgun components loose. With a strong kick, he'd activate the pumping mechanism, and bang, there you had it. Tashinori had been really amused when he'd gotten a look at them. Even though he called Izuku a fanboy, the younger man could see that on some level he was actually pretty flattered. He even said this worked out pretty well. The practice Izuku had over the years in mastering the blowback and recoil from the shotguns would lend some experience in dealing with one for all, though. And he'd made certain to underline this fact. The first times using it would still produce some nasty blowback considering he couldn't control it yet. He'd gotten them fixed up and repainted by one of the smiths in his town. He figured that since now he was going to become a real huntsman that he needed his weapons to look like those of a real huntsman. He'd asked for them to be colored forest green, which just seemed to fit him. After all, Izuku didn't want to hint too heavily at exactly where he'd gotten his semblance. The sound of the screen that had, previously, been playing news of a foiled heist stopped and caught Izuku's attention, causing him to snap the case shut. As he looked up, holy woe, Glinda Goodwitch, reaching into his bag, and pulling out Huntsman Analysis for the Future Volume 11. He flipped through the pages and yeah, there's no mistaking it, that's Glinda Goodwitch. Izuku had heard she taught at Beacon, but he didn't imagine that she'd actually be the one to greet the students, though that shouldn't have been a surprise. I mean, I'd heard that Goodwitch had been involved with thwarting the robbery on the news from last night, 
and because of feats like this that she repeatedly pulls off in the Vale area, she's actually a pretty well-respected and moderately famous huntress. Not to mention the power of her semblance, telekinesis, which is pretty crazy when you factor in that not only can she hold objects still, but with some application of her aura, she can even fix inanimate objects back into place. Plus, well, as much as she's popular for her strength and demeanor as a huntress, there's obviously other factors like how drop dead. DKU, shut up. His hands almost instinctively shot up to his mouth when he heard that voice yell out. At this point, it's become such an ingrained part of his lifestyle that he does it without thinking, both slapping his hands over his mouth and muttering out of control. His green eyes chance a glance around at the rest of the people on board the ship, and he rapidly realized two things. One was that everyone was looking at him with slightly off looks, and two was that, he had just missed pretty much everything Glinda had just said before her little video blinked out. Great. Just, just great. Man, talk about word vomit. Hopefully I didn't get any on my shoes. Eh, eh. A groan quickly followed that poor attempt at a joke as he just sighed and lowered his head, the Airbus coming to a halt. Okay, so maybe missing out on whatever important instructions were on Glinda's videos, and then showing off his muttering to all the potential classmates before him even got off this Airbus wasn't exactly a great first step to becoming a huntsman. In fact, maybe it was super embarrassing and made him want to crawl inside his suitcase for a moment, but, but he wasn't going to let it stop him. He'd stood on his two feet with a burst of energy, grabbing his bag and two suitcases as he puffed chest out. Like he kept telling himself, he's going to be a hero. He's going to get off this bus and attend the academy of his dreams. Beacon. Where heroic huntsmen like Tashinori and Inji Todoroki graduated from to become the respected huntsmen they are now. Where he'd graduate and become a hero worthy of succeeding Tashinori. Where he'd make him and everyone who had faith in him proud. That was limited to just Tashinori and his mother right now, but still, proud. As he stepped off that airbus and took a look at Beacon Academy's grounds with its massive arches, towering buildings and almost fantastical appearance, he couldn't help but smile. Today is the first day trip. You know what? Never mind. He could just die here. That would be fine too. He hit the ground face first with a bit of a thud. Really, he'd tripped and fallen over before. So he'd come to expect a certain sensation. A little bit of stinging pain that a little time would just let wear out on its own. What surprised him this time, however, was the utter lack of pain. Sure, he still felt the concrete beneath his face rubbing coarsely against his skin as he lay against it, but there's no pain. There's no sign that the skin broke or that he actually hurt himself. He was perfectly fine. His aura tanked it all and, judging by okay he was feeling, he didn't even take an actual hit to it. Holy whoa, this aura stuff was amazing. How did I live without it before? He smiled as his potential faux pas gave way to the fact that he didn't even hurt himself. He was still well on his way to having an amazing first. Come on, let's go see the campus. This is Beacon we're talking about, the most prestiwa. In his moment of internal celebration, someone stepped on the back of his head, lost their footing, and then promptly tripped and fell in front of him, landing flat on their face as well. Welp, this just became a conga line of embarrassment. Oh crap, I'm so sorry about that. She tends to get really excited and just stopped looking where she was going. Here, come on you too. He let out a groan as he felt someone grab him by the shoulder. Whoever it was had helped him to his knees whereupon he shook his head and reached up to take their offered hand. His face was a bit red from the fall and being ground into the concrete by the misstep, but he tried to be good-natured about it. No, it's okay. I really should have gotten up off the ground before anyone ran into me. I'm really, really, really. Izuku swallowed a rapidly developing lump in his throat as he saw who exactly it was that he caused to trip. Two young women, one roughly his own age and the other, actually looking a year or two younger than him. They didn't seem to have bags. Maybe they sent their things ahead to be taken care of by Beacon and they're looking right at him. Immediately his face goes red, and he loses what little ability to speak that he had, stumbling over his words as he tries to work out an apology. The girl in red seems to be as uncomfortable as he is, scratching at her arm slightly as she seems to move slightly closer to the blonde. The blonde in question seemed more amused than off-put, seeming to at least find this situation pretty funny. Oh hey, I recognize you now. Yeah, stood out a bit back there on the ship with that word vomit. If his face could have gone any more red at that moment, it would have. The blonde girl just had a bit of a laugh as the girl with black, or red, black red, hair seemed to just awkwardly look off to the side. It seemed she wasn't exactly great with strangers. He could sympathize. Your name's Deku, right? Well, it's good to meet you. 
The blonde couldn't help but chuckle as she reached over and placed a hand behind the girl in Red's back, pushing her forward a bit. I'm Yang Xiaolong, and this is my dear sister, Ruby Rose. Come on, Rubes, it's impolite to not at least say hi to the guy you stepped on. Yang, can we just? I'm really not. Well, USC Dashi stopped in mid sentence. Those names, they sounded quite familiar. Rose? Xiao Long? Izuka mentally flipped through his notebooks as he tried his best to recall. Holy WOH. Are these two related to Team SDRQ? That a no stop. Focus, okay. Izuku was known in his class to go off on nerd outs. Massive tangents describing huntsmen, tactics, history, and other tiny minueta that most people didn't know and didn't care about. Doing this now, to people he just met, well that wouldn't exactly make a good first impression. He put a clamp on that upcoming outburst and looked forward. Actually, my name isn't Deku. He managed to stammer out as he reached up to scratch the back of his head, lilac and silver eyes blinking slightly as Yang crossed her arms. Really? That one blonde guy called you by it, and you seem to answer pretty quick. Yang asked, her head tilted to the side as Izuku sighed a bit. Well you see, it's... Stupid Deku. Izuku flinched slightly before turning around and see Kaken approaching from behind, a sour look on his face. Get out of my way before I set you on fire. Immediately he hopped out of Kaken's way, hands held slightly defensively as he nervously chuckled. Oh hey good morning. Look, sorry about the Airbus on the way over here. Let's just get in here and do our best to dash. He doesn't even let Izuku finish as he just strides right on by him. Yang and Ruby, the latter of whom nervously stepping to the side herself as his friend, bully, rival, walks on by. The green-haired young man released a sigh of relief as Kaken just passes him by. Honestly, he hadn't bullied him nearly as much ever since Izuku ran in during the incident with the Ursa Major, but he's still been, well, Kaken. Anyway, it's okay. I get the picture. Yang seems a bit sour as she looks over her shoulder to watch Kaken walk off. Ruby meanwhile having starred on ahead at Izuku as she appeared curious about something. Kaken? Seems like a pretty weird name. The question snaps Izuku out of his own Kaken-induced panic as he shook his head. Oh, it's not his name either. His name's Katsuki Bakugo and well, I just call him Kaken. At this both sisters seem to curiously tilt their heads to the side. Seems a little weird to give your bully a funny nickname. Ruby muttered to herself as Yang snirked slightly, clearly finding it a bit amusing. Well you see, Kaken and I used to be friends, but, but then he decided he was going to be a huntsman, same as Izuku, and his parents want to have his aura manifested. Meanwhile, he and everyone else found out Izuku was broken. It seemed like such a weird reason for a friendship to have fallen apart. One day Kaken, while boisterous and very much the leader as always, was fine counting Izuku among his friends. The next, after coming back from a hike through the woods around Mountain Glen, he didn't think of Izuku as a friend anymore. But, I dunno, maybe he changed, or, I dunno. Point is that somewhere along the way, we just stopped being friends and he decided to be a bully instead. Yang folded her arms slightly as she frowned. A similar frown found on Ruby's face as she looks up to meet Izuku's eyes. So why do you keep calling him by his nickname then? I mean, I get that you used to be friends, but... Honestly, he'd never given it much thought. If he really had to sit down and give a solid answer, in the end, Kaken is still one of the coolest people Izuku knew. He was driven and strong and his own semblance, Izuku thought, was really, really cool. While Tashinori stood, and would always stand, at the pinnacle of what Izuku thought a huntsman should be and how they should act, there were always aspects of Kaken's drive and self-confidence that he admired, even as he relentlessly bullied Izuku for being broken. Maybe that was why he still called him by that old nickname, or, or, maybe he still wanted to be his friend. It was hard to say. So instead of giving a solid answer, he just chuckled and scratched at his mop of messy green hair, a wistful expression on his face. I dunno. Maybe, maybe I'm a bit sentimental. He was one of my only friends, and he really didn't want to sound lame by admitting that he basically had no friends after Kaken decided to turn on him. I'm still not sure I understand, but, if you say so. Ruby responds with a slight shrug of her shoulders, her sister just nodding slowly as she scratches at her chin a bit. That's all right. He barely understood it himself. He wouldn't readily expect others to get the very odd dynamic that existed between him and Kachin. Anyway, my name's actually Izuku Midoriya. I guess it's nice to meet both of you. You guess? Yang asks with a bit of a grin as he floundered a bit. I mean you both seem really nice, but, well, 
You really don't know how things are going to get off with people you meet by having them step on the back of your head and... Yang's laughter cut him off from running his mouth anymore as she shook her head. No worries, I wasn't offended and I'm sure my darling little sister can sympathize. She's not so good with the socializing either. Yang. Ruby bemoaned her sisters, teasing especially after said sister reached up to pat Ruby on the head. Even though Izuku was an only child he could still sympathize with Ruby's embarrassment, though at least Yang seemed to mean well. It's not that I'm not good at socializing. I just don't know anyone here except my sister. Yang grinned nice and wide as she pat Ruby's shoulder. Yeah. You see Izuku, my darling baby sis here, actually managed to get the higher-ups to notice how awesome she was and decided to drag her up from Signal Academy to come to Beacon two years early. As you can tell, my sis is the bee's knees. That really is impressive, Izuku thought as he looked over at the younger girl with a sudden appreciation. Being a hunter is a dangerous career path and usually the regulations over age and how one advances along the career track are strictly regulated. To have made an exception for someone two years younger than either myself or Kakan must have meant she had a lot of potential. Can you please stop calling me that? At this point the discomfort that Izuku had previously guessed was Ruby just flat out not liking him around starts to become clear. She's probably just as nervous and afraid as he was and embarrassed by her sister's attention. That really is impressive though, he said. Almost without thinking, the two sisters turn their attention back to him as Yang grins. See Rubes, even complete strangers know it. Ruby just groaned slightly as she shook her head, the blonde having turned her attention back to him. So what about you? I'm guessing you're my age, though you're kind of on the short side so. He just nodded to confirm. He was 17 and, yeah, he was short. Being broken all your life could do that a person. Where are you from? How'd you end up here? Cause, not for nothing or anything but you seem a bit skittish for this whole hunter thing. I mean, well, she wasn't entirely wrong, but, but she wasn't entirely right either. Well, you see, I grew up in Mountain Glen and yeah, before you ask that one, both Ruby and Yang's mouths snapped shut as he helpfully answered their question before they would even have a chance to ask it. It's kind of a whole different experience living somewhere that only exists. That's only still going because someone, a hero stepped up to save it. It was the most widely told story in Remnant. Mountain Glen had been on its last legs by the time that Tashinori showed up. The people had been forced into tunnel systems they'd had dug out for defense. The Vale Council had collapsed most of the tunnels leading directly to Vale itself. It had seemed like the Vale Governing Council had pretty much given up entirely on Mountain Glen. But then, fear not citizens, hope has arrived. Because I am here. The scars of Tashinori's battle against the Grim were plain to see across the entire city. The tunnels that had once been the last line of defense, the potential tomb of an entire city, now were used solely to give people a way to get down to the railways that connected Mountain Glen to Vale. When he was a child, he hadn't understood the full potential horror of what the people were about to go through, the desperation that must have eaten away at them. No. What he had understood from watching that video countless times through was no less meaningful. That in a moment devoid of hope, a giant of a man with resounding laughter arrived and smiled for everyone who was too afraid to. He fought for those who'd already counted themselves out and who'd been counted out by everyone who knew the situation. Even if it wasn't his problem, he did what he felt his duty was as a hunter and saved everyone. And he did it with a smile on his face. Ever since I was a little kid, it's been my dream to become a huntsman. My entire life, I've thought the coolest thing you could do was save people. As Izuku spoke, he felt his insecurities melt away for a moment, and a bright smile grace his features. A small, wimpy coward he may be, but when it came to his dreams, there was no doubt in his mind. I want people to see my smiling face and feel safe. It's really all I ever wanted. So I had no choice. I had to come to Beacon. It's my dream. He excitedly finished as B looked back. That sense of certainty and self-confidence begins to fade again but not from anything done by either of the two young women. Ruby looks like she practically has stars in her eyes while a wide grin stretches across Yang's face. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Whatever worries that Ruby Rose had about speaking with this boy before had melted away. I wanted to be a hunter my entire life too. Sure it wasn't because I grew up where the second greatest hunter first showed up, but well, I grew up with the absolute best one ever. He flinched back slightly, Ruby's sudden burst of enthusiasm having been a bit much for him to handle. It's why I was so excited about being accepted to Beacon early, right before I got nervous, but like you said, it's still my dream and it's really cool I get to be here. He chuckled nervously. Her enthusiasm obvious, 
to the point where Izuku thought for a moment that it might even surpass his own. Only for a moment though. He quickly gathered that once you manage to get Ruby going, it can be a bit hard to get her to stop. So he looked over to her sister for some help and... She was gone? When she noticed his odd look, Ruby turns her shoulder as well. The two think they can distantly see Young as she ran off with a group of friends. A faint call of well have fun with your friend Ruby. I'll see you at the main hall, could be heard. I think my sister just ditched us. Yeah. Do you know where the main hall actually is? I was kind of hoping you would. I kind of muttered over everything Ms. Goodwitch said, so I don't even know what we're supposed to be doing. Crap. He swallowed a small lump in his throat as he scratched the back of his head. His own inattention ended up getting the best of him this time, and now neither he nor Ruby knew exactly where to go. Young appeared to be a way off. That left only one option. I think we should try and see if anyone is still around here, and if they know where to go. Yeah, that sounds good, she said, shutting herself off slightly again. It took a moment of searching, but soon they spotted another person. A girl with long black hair with a black ribbon on her head. Before Izuku even had a chance to really say anything, Ruby started running off toward her and he, after a moment's hesitation, followed. Man, what is today? He began to contemplate everything that had already happened to him. I'm going to need to talk to another girl, a slight blush. I'm really not good at that. I mean, I'm not sure I've ever actually completed a conversation with a G dash. The realization hits him like a sack of bricks. Holy whoa, I've been talking to girls. Perhaps this wasn't the best thought to go into this conversation with, because the mere thought that he, Izuku Midoriya, have successfully bridged the gap of talking to the fairer sex has immediately sent his face a bit red and twisted his tongue into knots. So much so that when Ruby finally got the girl's attention and she turned around to look at the two of them with a pair of amber eyes, he practically froze up. Ooh, e. I Mizuku. Ah, nice to meet you. Izuku's attempts to control his own stuttering by speaking in bursts seemed to have surprised both Ruby and this girl, both of whom stared at him incredulously. Oh gods, this is going horribly. I just want directions. Just ask her for directions. Look, I just, I mean, we just saw you hanging out over here and I was wondering if you'd be so kind, if you'd maybe. The girl's eyes seemed to be slowly going wide as her own impressions of where this conversation is going seemed to form in her head. Izuku's attempts to put his foot in his mouth were thankfully cut off by Ruby as she stepped forward. Hey listen, sorry about that, Izuku hears, well he's kind of a nervous guy. We were just wondering if you knew where the main hall was. He was, well you were on the ship right, so he didn't hear what was going on and I've never been here. The black haired girl opened and closed her mouth a couple times. Between Izuku's stuttering mess and Ruby's own very quick sentence, she seemed to have needed a moment to catch up. After a few seconds Izuku watched her look both Ruby and himself up and down, her amber eyes watching both of their faces carefully. After a moment she sighed and turns toward Ruby. Odd friend you seem to have gotten yourself here. Ruby blinked for a moment before she chuckled. Oh well we actually only just ran into each other. We're kind of just stuck without knowing our way around. Some of the initial nervousness Ruby showed when they first got introduced still seem to be lingering, even if it's been lessened somewhat by their interactions. Moving on from that Ruby, turn back to the girl. Anyway, uh, he gave you his name. My name's Ruby. We could really use your help. The black-haired girl just thought to herself for a moment before she just nodded. I guess I'm on my way there anyway. And you don't seem like too much trouble at least. The black-haired girl spared an odd glance at Izuku, which caused him to lock up a bit before she sighed. Just follow me. The crowd went off this direction and it shouldn't be too hard to find the main hall. As she turned to lead the two off toward the main hall, she stopped and considered something, turning her head to look at both of them over her shoulder. The name's Blake, nice to meet you. Ruby and him both sighed in relief, before he offered Ruby a very much appreciative thank you which was returned with a ready you're welcome, before the three of them wandered off toward the main hall. As the three all walked along, went by mostly in silence, Blake still seemed wary of Izuku from his little show from earlier, but she was hardly hostile. Though, she didn't seem like the talkative type. She hasn't offered up much to break the silence. Of course, neither had Izuku, though that's mostly because he had been pretty sure he'd messed all this up. Again, Ruby on the other hand seems to be fidgeting and, before long, she pulled out a folded up red piece of metal from her back. So, I have this. She unfolds the bit of metal with a flick, the mecha shift weaponry slowly forming into a, holy whoa, that's a high caliber sniper scythe. Izuku's neck nearly snapped as he looked at the fully unfurled weapon. Got it in one. 
Ruby seemed genuinely excited as she brought her weapon out, eyes sparkling as she hugged it. This is my baby, Crescent Rose, and you're right on the money there, Izuku. She's a high-caliber sniper scythe. Blake watched the pair with some disbelief, a surprised look on her face as she looked over to him. How did you even guess that? I don't even know what that thing could have been from looking at it. He can't help but smile as he drops his suitcase and bag before reaching into his other bag, pulling out the right volume of Huntsman analysis for the future. The HCSS is one of the most powerful tools a hunter can have at their disposal. Great at clearing away large number of grim in either of its scythe forms, and with the sniper rifle being able to nail targets from so far away, it's a great weapon. The only problem is that it's crazy hard to use and a bit expensive to maintain and upgrade, but once you have a handle on it, it's deadly. Blake and Ruby looked over his shoulder to see the prodigious amount of notes he'd taken. Blake seemed rather astonished while Ruby's eyes glimmered. Wow, Izuku, you weren't kidding. Being a huntsman must really have been your dream if you took all these notes. Izuku sheepishly scratched the back of his head as he put the book away. With notes that good, you must have a crazy amazing weapon stored away. Can I see it? Please. What's her name? Oh, they're nothing really all that special compared to what you've got but, well, Emerald Gust are fine for me I guess. Blake arched an eyebrow as she watched Izuku set down the case. Ruby, with an excited look at seeing a potentially new weapon, watches as he popped open the case and immediately set about setting the weapons up on his arms, leaving the boots inside of the case. When he settled them Izuku took a steady breath as he deactivated the safeties on the weapon, whereupon he gave a bit of a forceful shove with both arms. Immediately the mechanisms within Emerald Gust tripped into action. Izuku opened his hands as best he could so that the handles from the underside of the gauntlet can slip right into his grip. They're just small enough that the fist he'd make won't break his fingers when he threw a punch, but, well, before he actually got an aura and got onto Tashinori's training program, he was too weak to actually handle the full brunt of the kickback from these. Next the pump shotgun itself slid into view as it curved right over his arm, almost like a small cannon. The entire color scheme fit together well with the name and, having fully exposed the machinery, he flipped the safeties back on. It's, well, it's just a pump shotgun integrated into some gauntlets and bracers and some armored boots. Nothing really all that fancy, just that whenever I punch dash, the force of the blow will trip the shotgun's mechanisms reloading them and firing them so that you can add a bit more bang to your punch. Ruby recited almost verbatim as he blinked slightly in surprise. He knew that his weapons were simple, but he still didn't think they'd be that easy to pick apart. Perhaps noticing his slight dip in demeanor, Ruby chuckles as she waves him off. Oh, don't worry I didn't just pick it up from looking. Yang's Ember Celica works very similarly. Though she didn't go for the gauntlet and bracer design, she went more for bracelets than what you did says it makes it too hard for her to really grab onto things. Izuku nodded, knowing that as a weakness in his design. But these do protect your hands really well. I bet you barely even feel any of the kickback from the mechanism or the brunt of the blow. Yang had to start wearing gloves because after a while, even her aura would get exhausted from protecting her hands from all the punches she'd throw. You circumvented that right there? And built in a pretty handy stabilizer to keep the recoil from throwing you off. He couldn't help but smile a bit as he listened to his weapons get complimented. Honestly, he'd made these partially to help feel like Tashinori, the blast of the shotgun giving him visions of performing his own smashes when he were younger. Everything else was just to compensate for him not having aura and not being as strong as other kids in the program. Though he kept that bit to himself. I'm guessing that the same's for the boots too? Blake actually injects herself into the conversation to ask this, but he just nod. This is his own field of comfort too. Not so much the weapon stuff. He barely knew anything about them really, but being a hunter and the tools of the trade. Yeah, it produces a similar effect for my kicks. Though I have to be a bit more careful with them. If I turn the safeties off on them, I better mean to use them otherwise. You might accidentally trip them. Blake finishes as she nods in understanding. Not bad I guess, gives you more options. And I guess there are worse weapons for people who just want to get in and do damage. Izuka nodded. In all honesty, that is the idea. He's not strong enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with strong grim for an extended period, or at least he's pretty sure he isn't. If he can just get in one solid punch and finish them off, well that should be enough. At least until he got used to this whole huntsman thing. What about you Blake? What kind of weapon do you have? Does it have a name? Ruby asked, clearly having gotten pumped off of this talk of weapons. Blake seemed to think for a moment, but it seemed Ruby's energy is infectious. I don't have it on me, but it does, Gamble Shroud. It's a... Variant Ballistic Chain Scythe. It's a katana whose base can act as a pistol, 
with the sheath capable of acting as a cleaver, and when I wrap this ribbon around the katana and pistol component, I can make it into a kuzurigama. Whoa, that is so cool. Ruby's energy practically vibrated out of her body as she spoke, Blake stepping back from the display though not without a small smile gracing her lips. It seems even she can't quite ignore her tool of the trade being greatly praised. That is pretty impressive. It'd pretty much let you engage from any range you wanted, Izuku said to himself, his hand coming up to his lips. The only thing keeping him from having gone into one of his muttering spell is the fact that he don't have any of his analysis notebooks right in front of him to write down notes on. That's, that's the plan, one hopes. Blake says with a bit of a sigh as she steps further back from Ruby. We'd probably better hurry if we want to make it to the main hall in a timely manner. Izuku and Ruby snapped out of each of their states and nodded as they followed Blake again. For his part, he was just eager to get this day on track, though he couldn't say that it's been all bad all things considered. As the three of them entered Beacon's main hall they found the stage largely empty and most of the students just sitting around and socializing. Despite some initial panic about having potentially missed Ashpin's speech, two of the three were greatly relieved when a nearby student wondered aloud when this whole deal was going to get started. After letting out a sigh of relief, Ruby's silver eyes looked around the room and, eventually, locked down on her sister. Oh, there's Yang. Well listen I gotta go give her a piece of my mind for just ditching us. It was nice meeting you Blake, Izuku. With that Ruby practically disappeared in the blink of an eye and reappeared beside her sister immediately yelling at her. Huh. Izuku looked back at where Ruby had been standing, before returning his attention to the bickering siblings. Maybe that's her semblance? Maybe it's teleportation, or it greatly increases her speed. Either way that'd be pretty powerful if she... You're doing the mumbling thing again. Izuku slapped his hands over his mouth. Saudi. He said through his hands as he looked over at where the voice originated, as Blake just raised an eyebrow at him. You really are just a nervous guy, aren't you? She then shrugged. Well, I've done my good deed for the day. I'm going to go find some place to read before Ashbin gets set up. Later, I guess. Izuku watched Blake walk off, grateful she had not commented further on his little trip. He let out a sigh of relief as he glanced around the main hall. A nervous pit formed in his stomach as he saw so many people, who all wanted to attend Beacon just like him. In all likelihood, one of these people were going to be his partner, or his teammates. Given that, well... Maybe he should reach out and socialize. Or maybe he could just hide in a corner until Ashbin came out to give his speech. That was an option too. Okay, okay, calm down man. He began to survey the crowd again. So your acquaintances, well they walked off and left you alone. No big deal, right? You can salvage this. I mean, it's not like you're terrible at introducing yourself to people. You can totally handle meeting someone else. He paused and thought for a second. I hope. He swallowed the lump in his throat once more, before he took stock of his surroundings and the people there. After a moment, he arrived at the conclusion that, aside from Kakin, he really don't know anyone here. I guess it was really true. Me and Kakin really were the only people coming here to Beacon from our school. He was filled with a mix of relief and trepidation. On the one hand, no one besides him had any idea he was, had been broken. But then, it also meant he didn't really know anyone here at all. Oh sure. They all thought him a fool, but at least he knew them. The thought of meeting nothing but new people put a weird, nervous energy in his gut. And he might screw it up. Ruby and Blake had thought he was a weirdo. Okay, he kind of was. If Young hadn't stuck around, or Ruby hadn't explained what he had been looking for, he probably would have messed this all up. I can make a good impression on people, he declared in his mind, before slinking back down once again. At least? I'm pretty sure I can. He looked back out at the crowd. Well, third time's the charm I guess? As his green eyes scoped around he finally stopped when he noticed the white-haired girl from outside, though she seemed to have finally put her luggage away. Now that he had a closer view of her, gods, was he really going to try to introduce himself to another girl? Another very pretty girl at that? Well, I guess so if the fact that my feet are carrying me over toward her is any indication. Okay Izuku, you can do this. Just, just don't throw up, don't start stuttering like crazy. Don't try to sound creepy and don't, don't, don't think too much about this. You can do this. You can totally do this. Izuku finally swallowed the lump in his throat as he was only two yards away from the young woman. While his demeanor still held a lot of nervous energy that was readily apparent, it no longer looked like he was about to die of a heart attack. As the girl with light blue eyes watched him approach, he could see her quirk her eyebrow. Finally, she sighed as she crossed her arms over her chest, 
a slight huff having followed the gesture. Yes, can I help you? There was a certain guarded nature to her body language as she watched Izuku approach and, for a moment, Izuku had found himself wanting to buzz off. However, after having steeled himself, he just stood up as straight as he could and said, Hello, I'm Izuku Midorea. Nice to meet you. There. A good, proper greeting. I barely even stuttered at all. Maybe I'm finally making progress at this whole socializing thing. Izuku was practically shaking on the inside. Though he might have been a bit louder than he intended as, for a moment, the girl flinched back before she shook away her surprise. Yeah. Hello. Nice to meet you. She seemed a bit perplexed and, for a moment, he's ready to panic again. Oh gods, did I already mess up Dash? Like I asked, can I help you? As she asked this he snapped himself out of his death spiral and blinked. Well, I don't want anything in particular. But I guess if I'm introducing myself, well, I guess it'd be nice to know who I'm meeting. That's, that's how this goes when you introduce yourself to a stranger, right? He asked a bit nervously. For a moment he saw that the girl seemed genuinely surprised. But that quickly gave away to a rather amused laugh. Right. You don't know who I am. Sure. Now, can I help you? She asked, a mix of annoyance and amusement in her voice, as if she'd simultaneously pleased and bothered that she saw through some kind of ruse. As Izuku stood there and nervously fidgeted he saw her brow furrow. You do know who I am. You have to. Otherwise, why are you here? Again, he just kind of stood there a bit nervously. The girl's rather forceful personality having pinned him down. As she looked him over, he saw her light blue eyes snap open a bit. You. You actually don't know who I am? He just nodded head as she put her hands on her hips. I'm Vaishni. Izuku paused for a moment and brought his hand to his mouth as he thought. I really don't know who Vaishni. Wait, Shni. Like the Shni Dust Company. They're the biggest dust producer on Remnant. They're pretty much the only reason the increased demand for more dust by Huntsman has been met since Tashinori arrived. He looked down at his case for Emerald Gust. I have some of their stuff on me right now. He looked back at her. If she's a Shni, then she must at least be related to the company, right? Well, no, I haven't heard of you. I'm sorry. I'm guessing you're part of the company, though? Or related to the Shni family? Izuku had kept himself from laughing at seeing how absolutely stunned the girl looked when he said that. It honestly was kind of fun. You, I, I'm the heiress to the Shni Dust Company, she said, almost sounding indignant, as she looked Izuku dead in the eye. Oh, oh, uhu, that would make her the heiress to one of the biggest, most valuable and powerful companies in all of Remnant. He still hadn't fully processed it, and I just walked right on up, talked to her like it was nothing and then proceeded to say that I didn't even know who she was, right to her face. Oh, crap. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Izuka's brain practically screamed at him from within his skull. You're standing in front of someone who's the next in line to inherit perhaps the largest corporation in all of Remnant, whose actions have consequences all over the world, and the only way you can think to describe it is pretty cool. My word how are you so bad at this? Izuka's own disbelief at his words was probably only matched by Weiss, who's just stared at him with pretty substantial amount of disbelief. Come on, you have to have more than that to say, right? His brain attempted to restart itself. Uh, I didn't know that. I just thought that. It'd be pretty nice to say hi. That how people make friends. Or at least, I'm pretty sure that's how. Are you for real? Weiss asked, her head tilted to the side as if trying to get a better look at him. As if more visual information might have helped her solve the mystery of why he bothered to walk up and, well, bother her. I think so? I mean, air, sorry. I'm not too good with people, he sighed really not happy with how things had went. I don't exactly do this a lot. But, well, we're all going to school here for now to be hunters, right? So I just thought that we should get along, right? As he spoke, he saw Weiss Schnee's gaze narrow slightly before she twisted her head around. He saw her lock her gaze on a few people who didn't take much notice and, as she turned back to look at him, he could just barely make out her chewing on the far side of her lip. Eventually Weiss sighed slightly as she waved her hand. No, no you're right. I'm sorry. I'm not used to being someplace where there's people who genuinely don't know who I am. I'm not terribly good with complete strangers either, I suppose. Despite having said that, Izuku felt like she had significantly sold herself short. She's been pretty proper this entire time, and he didn't think she'd stammered or stuttered at all, even when she's been caught off her guard. She put her hands on her hips again. 
So you're really just here to introduce yourself then? Nothing else? He nodded vigorously in response, not quite trusting himself to not put his foot in his mouth. Light blue eyes pierced into his green and, after a moment, he saw her offer a restrained, but still polite, smile. Well, Izuku Midoriya? She asked to confirm, and he nodded. It is a pleasure to meet you. She seemed to search for the right word for this encounter, and just seemed to default to a more plain one but, honestly, he perfectly fine with this. Before either Izuku or Weiss could continue that string of thought, the sound of a microphone turning on snapped both of their attentions forward to the stage. There, plain for everyone to see, was one Ashbin, headmaster of Beacon Academy. It was unmistakable. The cane, the silver head of hair, the glasses and just the general demeanor screamed everything he'd ever heard about the headmaster of the most prestigious hunter academy in all of Remnant. As he stared out across the hall, his eyes scanned the audience. After a moment, he began to speak. I'll keep this brief. You have traveled here today in search of knowledge, to hone your craft and acquire new skills, and, when you have finished, you plan to dedicate your life to the protection of the people. But I look amongst you, and all I see is wasted energy, in need of purpose, direction. You assume knowledge will free you of this, but your time at this school will prove that knowledge can only carry you so far. It is up to you to take the first step. As he spoke, he practically stopped in place. His gaze locked forward as he addressed the crowd. Despite that and despite knowing he's likely just commanding attention by looking so imposing, Izuku couldn't help an odd feeling that overtook him. He couldn't help but feel that those eyes of his remain locked on a few key students for several moments, and then they locked on to Izuku himself. Izuku then just shook his head and decided to write that off as just nerves his mind playing tricks on him while the headmaster gave what he thought of as a very intense and inspirational speech. Of course, Beacon Academy could impart him with a great deal of knowledge and even some new skills he'd never held before, but like with one for all, it wouldn't matter if it was given to him. He'd have to work hard to actually be worthy of it, whether the it in this case is one for all or knowledge. Without my own hard work, nothing the teachers here or Tashinori gives or teaches me will matter. He stared up at Ashbin, a small smile developing, and I will work hard. After all, I already know my purpose, my direction. I've known it for years now, for an instant. He thought he almost saw Tashinori himself looking down on him, and I've already had to work three times harder than anyone to be worthy of it. Doing what Ashbin asks of me here, that's an easy ask as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to be a huntsman, a herd dash. His internal ramblings are interrupted when he swore he saw a spark of genuine amusement in Ashbin's gaze before he moved on from Izuku. The initiation exam will begin tomorrow. For tonight, you all will be sleeping in the main hall. You are dismissed. With that Ashbin just walked off the stage. Izuka heard some muttering from other students about how that seemed like an odd speech, or how it ran pretty short. Some even murmured that Ashbin probably phoned it in because he's had to give it so often now. He's right though. If we want to have a right to be here, we have to work hard. And that starts tomorrow? He mumbled to himself a smile on his face. That speech was, well said. He froze up, suddenly realizing he'd let himself float off into his own little world while Weiss was still basically right next to him. He jumped in a bit of surprise as he tried to recompose himself from what he has to imagine was a pretty dorky looking moment. He was surprised to find that Weiss seems to be looking him over with an approving look. Well, it looks like I put my luggage off to the side for nothing. If you'll excuse me, Izuku, I need to go procure it. He just nodded dumbly as Weiss walked off and, after he took a moment to compose himself again, then walked off towards the lockers. The person you dropped off your original luggage with had said that you'd be able to find it there. It had been pretty late when everyone had arrived at Beacon, he reasoned to himself as he looked out at the setting sun. While Ashbin's speech hadn't run long, it had been scheduled pretty late in the day to allow as many students to arrive in time as possible. Izuku had come in pretty late himself because he had had to get here from Mountain Glen. As he popped open the locker and found his suitcase and bags there, he smiled as he started to delve into it for his sleepwear for tonight. As he did so, he heard a couple guys close their own rocket lockers shut, wide grins on their faces as they jump up and down in place. Dudes, I can't believe it. We're going to be sleeping with the girls in the main hall tonight. What? Yeah, I was surprised too. Figured that they'd at least put some stuff to keep both sides from seeing each other but man, they're just letting it be tonight. Kind of surprised for such a fancy pants place like this. What? Yeah, dude. This is our opportunity to show off for the ladies. Maybe if we impress, am enough, we might just be looking to get ourselves some girlfriends from this. 
Now, tell me honestly, this shirt make me look buff? You know it, man. Come on, let's get out there. What? Okay, deep breaths, Izuku. There's no way that's true, right? They wouldn't just shove a bunch of teenage boys and girls into the same room and just leave it like that, right? He practically tiptoed back over to the entrance to the entrance hall and, and he felt himself pale. No, there it was. Two sides. One side with most of the guys and the other side with most of the girls. He would have said most because he definitely spotted some crossover. He quickly ran back into the locker room and started sweating bullets. Okay, chill. There wasn't any reason to worry, right? I mean, I have lots of changes of workout clothes. Sure, it might look a little weird to go to sleep in long-sleeved pants and a long-sleeved sweatshirt, but that isn't too unusual. He placed his hands on his face. I can just say I get cold at night if anyone asks. It's better than potentially embarrassing myself. Izuku had been keeping an eye open throughout most of the day, and he swore all the girls in this school were drop-dead gorgeous. And most of the guys looked a lot better than he did too. No one would want to. Hold it there, you damn nerd. At that instant, Tashinori's voice rang in his ear. Are you really going to back down this early? But, but, he spoke thought in response. There's a lot of GI dash. Ah, do not worry, my boy. Tashinori cut him off with a great laugh. I've seen your body, molded into a facsimile of my own. You've seen how impressive these muscles are. So why not show off some? It's time to show your classmates what you're really made of. His face went completely red. He looked back out towards the hall, and then began to think. Well, he supposed that there's always going to be the chance that he'll room with some girls if he managed to get on a team. After all, teams are expected to live with each other in the same dorm rooms, and they aren't separated by sex. It would probably be prudent to try to get used to these kind of living arrangements beforehand, right? After all, he really didn't want to sleep in his workout clothes every single night for the rest of his stay here at Beacon. Right? Mind Tashinori confirmed. In fact, for a brief moment, Izuku felt unusually bold and even considered something a bit more extreme. Maybe that's Tashinori's influence shining through? Either way, he immediately thought better of it and slipped on his shorts and a t-shirt. They didn't fully expose him, which was good. But, yeah, it's a lot easier to tell what he has got going in these rather than his old school's uniform. Hell. For a moment he even looked in mirror and smiled to himself. He's got a long way to go before he's anything like Tashinori or on his level in any way. But, well, he's made progress. And he worked hard for it. He should be proud of it. Absolutely correct me, Doria, my boy. Mind Tashinori laughed one last time. His voice fading into the background. Now get out there and show them what you're made of. He takes a deep breath, trying to prep himself. He's still clearly nervous about going through with his idea but, well hey. He can't back out now. Well, he can, but, but well, he shouldn't. Geez, I don't think dad would appreciate all the boys. I know I do, Rar. Izuku hadn't turned his head to face the sounds of Ruby's or Yang's voice as he heard them nearby. He'd psyched himself up to the point where he'd actually out here in just a t shirt and shorts, and he'd managed to pull through this little show without going absolutely red in the face from embarrassment. But it had taken a lot of focus. He felt the eyes of a fair few girls on him appreciating his past ten months' worth of effort. A few giggles are in earshot as whispers rang out from the girls' side of the auditorium. He even knew that some of the guys on their side had nodded their heads in approval, a few nice mans being thrown his way as he walked by. Of course others just scoffed as they kept on trying to show themselves off for the girls. He's still being noticed. Some girls even cooed at the odd mix of built hunter and spooked little church mouse he seemed to have pulled off. Izuku thinks that's probably made him feel even more embarrassed than stepping out dressed like that in the first place. Then again, that wasn't so bad. Or at least, it wasn't as uncomfortable as he had thought it would be while he had been panicked in the locker room, thinking he was about to get eaten by a horde of sharks and laughed off of campus. It could happen, but this was pretty good. He was far from the center of attention but, well, it had been an interesting experience. He'd never have done something like this at his old school. He'd never have dressed up in a way that girls would be remotely interested in him. It's another way he'd changed over his time with Tashinori, he supposed. Well hey there Izu, where were you hiding all that earlier? Immediately his efforts to keep the red off his face fell through as Yang hollered over at him. That immediately caused him to jump a bit as he looked over in Yang and Ruby's direction. Ruby just hid her face in her pillow, embarrassed for and by her sister, while Yang was just laughed hysterically. Oh, oh they're dressed in sleepwear too. In fact, all the girls are. His focus on keeping his gaze locked steady on ahead finally failed as he took notice of the fact that his earlier statement was right. Pretty much every girl here at Beacon was gorgeous. How is that even possible? 
He had gone back to looking on straight ahead. A few laughs and giggles came from the girls and a few hearty guffaws from the guys as he tried to maintain his composure. He realized that while it is getting late, the main hall had hardly hit lights out yet. A lot of people were still up and about doing things. Some had been reading, others were talking and, yes, there were the aforementioned guys who were doing their best to try to attract a girl with all the grace of a barfly. Not that some of them seemingly hadn't succeeded, mind you, but still. He wondered if he was up for trying to meet another person. The earlier meeting with Weiss really hadn't go too badly and Yang's friendly nature seemed to help ease him into a nice acquaintanceship with Ruby, who then did the same for him as it concerned Blake. Honestly, he had time and he wasn't too tired, though bed had started to sound increasingly attractive. On the one hand, he had not wanted to get surrounded by too many people. He was already uncomfortable as it is, no need to turn his already red face into a tomato. As he looked around for someone else to talk to, really wanting to try to continue building these connections, so his time here at Beacon wouldn't be as unbearable as it was back in his old combat school. He spotted a couple people who've broken off from everyone to be by themselves. Blake seemed to be busy reading a book, so he didn't want to bother her too much. There was this guy with red and white hair who's sitting off by himself, and, for a moment, he took a couple steps toward him. One look from him, however, shook Izuku a bit. He felt pretty intense. Not in an aggressive way, but he just seemed like he has a lot on his mind at the moment. Izuku laughed nervously before he backed off and looked for someone else to talk to. He eventually spied the red-haired girl from earlier in the day sitting off by herself. She's dressed in some pretty simple sleep attire, a t-shirt and a pair of sweatpants, and she seemed to be trying to make herself a bit scarce. If someone noticed her she'd nod and smile, but there seems to be some hesitancy toward it, almost as if she was nervous about something. Eventually she noticed his approach and probably took notice of the rather scarce way he dressed. He watched her put on as polite an expression as she can, a smile even accompanying it, but even his meager skills at socializing could tell that she was increasingly uncomfortable the closer he got. Still, that seemed to be how most of these situations were starting so. Hey, who knows, maybe he could change that. Ah, uh, hello. I Mizuku Midorea. He said bolstered by the fact that compared to walking about in his sleepwear, just going off and talking to someone was much easier in comparison. Hushi seems almost as uncomfortable as I feel right now. That's kind of reassuring. Oh, hello. It's Er. Nice to meet you. She spoke in a somewhat stilted manner as she watched him. Her green eyes peeled for some expected action as he just stood there. He waits for her to give her name in turn, but she seems hesitate. She arched an eyebrow, as if waiting for him to make the next move. Er. So, what's your name? Pardon? You know your name? It's part of how greetings go, right? I can't just keep calling you the red-haired girl in my head. Can I? No, probably not. He awkwardly admitted all this as the girl just blinked at him, tilting her head to the side curiously. I'm, my name is Pira Nikos. Oh, well, it's nice to meet you, Pira. I've just been introducing myself around because, well, we're all going to be students here, right? Figured it'd be good if we could all get along. The line of reasoning flowed more freely from his mouth this time around than it had with Weiss his experience over the day and the somewhat easier circumstances, compared to prancing around in one sleepwear, making this a lot easier for him. Pira just blinked as she looked at him, tilting her head to the side. Oh, you, you don't know who I am? Oh, gods, did I mess up again? Oh, oh no, should I? I'm sorry. I did this once before already with another student here. If I should, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean dash. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. It's weird, despite how fervently she'd reacted to Izuku and how almost panicked she seemed by your reaction, he could almost swear that the corners of her lips had twisted up into a bit of a grin. I mean, don't worry about it. It's nothing really all that important. So you were just introducing yourself? Well, Izuku Midoriya, it is very nice to meet you. He smiled and nodded back. Honestly, she did seem very polite and now, for whatever reason, whatever discomfort she seemed to have felt had at least lessened a bit. Still, he wasn't going to lie and say he wasn't curious about what exactly it is he'd apparently missed about her. She seemed almost pleased that he didn't know about it, whatever it is, which seemed weirdly at odds with how Weiss reacted earlier today. As Pira tried to wave off the, he didn't know exactly but call it a thing for now. Izuku pondered the possibility of trying to ask her about what she'd been talking about. As Izuku looked at her though, he could see that she was almost pleased that he didn't know. Maybe that was the source of her discomfort with him approaching her at first? Either way, Izuku thought about it and realized that it'd be rude to pry and, while he didn't know too much about her yet, Pira had seemed like a nice person. 
There was no reason to go digging if she told him that it doesn't really matter, right? Okay, sure. If it isn't all that important then I won't be too bothered about it. That sound good? He asked, sheepishly scratching the back of his head. The fact that Pira looked positively ecstatic and gives him a firm nod told him that he probably made the right choice. Sounds very good. Thank you, Izuku. She took a short pause before continuing. Anyway, it's rather admirable that you're going out of your way to speak to our fellow classmates. I can tell that it might not be well. Pira scratched her cheek a bit as she thought of how best to phrase this, but he just chuckled and continued to scratch the back of his head. Not very good at it? Don't worry about it. I'm not. I didn't have a lot of interaction with people before I came here, but, well, I figure if we all have an opportunity for a fresh start, might as well try to make it a good one, right? Pira nodded in agreement as a smile tugs at her lips. I agree, though that can be harder for some to achieve than others. She admitted as she looked around at the broader main hall and all the people in it. So, have you given much thought to teams? He tilted his head to the side. You yourself said that you want to try to see if you can get along with the people here, and, well, some of them may end up being your teammates by tomorrow. What are your thoughts on the matter? Pira asked curiously as she tipped her head to the side. He brought a hand up to his mouth for a second, as he took a careful second to consider this. I have met a lot of people today and, despite my own awkwardness, they all do seem very nice. Ruby, Yang, Blake, Waze, Pirha, Kakin. Okay, maybe not Kakin, but still, I do know him. And those are just the people I know so far. Who knows what other kinds of cool people are here. Still, I can't exactly speculate based on folks you haven't met. He continued to pause for a moment as he took in Pira's question. I thought it might have seemed a bit odd to be jumping the gun this far when I hadn't even been fully accepted into Beacon's program. But if Pira's also given some thought to it, maybe it wasn't that odd? In which case? Hmm, well, I mean, I guess I have. As he said that he excused himself for a moment to go back to his locker. Upon returning, he had a small stack of notebooks with him, various volumes of his Huntsman analysis for the future. Pira blinked clearly surprised by that as he cracked open one of the volumes. Keep in mind that I've only really spoken with four people people here so far, besides you I mean, and one person I know from back home who doesn't like me. So I don't know a whole lot of people. But that's fine. Teams are four people total, and I don't really know any of you five well enough to say that I don't want you all on my team. So I'm basically fine with anyone I've met today. Pira actually smiled a bit at that basic compliment, before he turned back to his books. That being said, there usually is an order for how partners and teams are put together in hunter academies. Usually there's a system of checks based upon a singular hunters, or a pair of partners, strengths and weaknesses that go into how teams are structured. Especially looking at the big academies in Atlas and Mistral, there's a general theme of creating teams that make up for each individual member's failings. Take for example the recent partner pair of Shinji Nishiya and Yutakiyama. Yu has a strength semblance that not only greatly increases her physical prowess but, as a small side effect, causes growth in her body. This makes her great in close quarters fights, and she does have weapons on hand that give her range, but it's not what she's good at. While Shinji Nishiya, on the other hand, is more range-focused, even using his semblance as a means of ensnaring foes away from him, or just putting some obstacles in between them and him. The two together cover for the other's weaknesses in these regards. Or, to put all of this more simply, teams are highly structured in most cases, which is what makes Beacon Academy odd, you see. Edzuku. He immediately went red in the face as he realized that he's been going off on one of his usual muttering storms. He clasped his hands over his mouth and looked over to Pirahu, while looking a bit weirded out by his sudden dip into muttering hell, had kept a small smile on her face. I appreciate all of this information. It sounds like you've given it a lot of thought, but maybe slow down a little bit? She asked gently while he took a deep breath and nodded. Yeah, okay, sorry. He did his best to shake off the embarrassment as he turned back to his volumes and resumed flipping through it. Anyway, like I said, Beacon's odd in that case because you don't see a lot of that similar solid structure. People like to point to Tashinori and Inji, but they're more the exception than the rule. Far more often teams turn out like Team SDRQ when it comes to how their partner pairs and whole teams are structured. The team was generally made up of people who just got into close range and stayed there. Taeyong Xiaolong was a brawler. Raven Branwen was amazing with a blade, and while a lot of people think that Crow Branwen's weapon could be classified as a high-caliber sniper scythe, truth is that it mecha shifted into a shotgun or a sword, so he was generally close range all the way down. Even Summer Rose wasn't particularly known for keeping her distance, instead being remembered for slaying high-class Grim. You normally wouldn't want this. 
People who can attack Grimm from far off are usually capable of picking off high-priority or dangerous targets before they get close up, while people who can generally fight toe-to-toe -to -toe can keep Grimm off of those members of their team and innocent civilians. Not to mention how this mix can help in dealing with various criminals and other rogue elements. Despite all this, Team SDRQ graduated at the top of their class and were generally considered the top team of their year of any Hunter's Academy. This isn't even an isolated incident. Beacons earned its reputation by churning out top hunters and teams of them, but the hunters it does it with are usually considered odd compared to how other academies structure things. They keep it a secret as to how they organize teams so no one can say for certain why this happens, but I dunno. It almost seems like it's completely random. He finished as he leaned back a bit, Pira having seemed really surprised by that. Really? Well, I mean, that can't be right. Beacon Academy's at the top of the system, putting out the most well-known and influential hunters of these past generations. Surely they couldn't accomplish that if they put the teams together by random chance. Pira asked, almost as if trying to force that to be the answer, as he just bit his knuckle a bit. I know, I know, but considering all the teams I have written down here, it's the only thing that makes sense without allowing for some mystery phenomena. Beacon would only know as much as the combat schools would tell them, so it's not like they have some special knowledge about the kids coming into their school. And considering what they'd know, you'd figure they'd follow the same track as the other hunter academies, it'd be what makes the most logical sense. The fact that they don't and that their teams tend to be so skewed one way or the other most times, I dunno. I want to think it's something deeper too, but the simplest answer given what we know is that it's just random chance. Pira actually took a moment to consider that point of view and, though he wrote it off, he swore there was a bit of a spark in her eyes as she turned back to him. Well, I suppose letting the dice fall where they may wouldn't be such a bad thing. He chuckled nervously as he shrugged. I dunno about that. For all I know, random chance would end up with me being on a team with Kakin, and that's a recipe for dysfunction, he joked before the conversation moved on. My goodness, you do know a lot about this. He blushed slightly as Pira said that, scratching the back of his head nervously. Ever since I was a little kid. I've always dreamed of becoming a huntsman. You know, be the kind of hero who can inspire people and keep them safe. So I've, kind of, sort of, obsessively took notes whenever I could to try and help me keep up with my peers. The red-haired young woman nodded as he spoke. Despite his expectations, she looked more impressed by that than put off, which his previous classmates had been. Then again, his previous classmates had known he was broken at the time. So to them it was weird and a waste of time. So, given all of this, how would you yourself structure a team out of the people you know? Izuku frowned a bit as he looked back at his notes. I, I'm not too sure of that myself. It's not like I'm completely clueless, heck. I just rounded off a lot of stuff that made up teams generally, even given Beacon's oddities. But, well, putting that information to good use was another thing entirely. He put his hand to his chin as he continued to think. Ruby had a HCSS, a real one and seemed to have a speed-boosting semblance if her sudden run over to Yang was any indication. Ruby did say that Yang actually used a set of weapons similar to mine and was a brawler as well. So I would pretty much fit in here too, considering that I had a similar weapon to her with a similar skill set to use it. Blake's gamble shroud had a lot of potential ranges and uses given its multiple forms and how she can use her ribbon along with it to extend its range. Why, sir? Well, you didn't get an opportunity to ask her about what she was good at. Though considering her family, maybe it involved dust? Then here was Kakin, but I don't really think that me and Kakin being on the same team would be good. Not that Kakin isn't amazing. He is. His semblance makes him absolutely deadly at close range, and he's built his weapon to build upon that advantage and cover a few weaknesses. But, well, given how Kakin really doesn't seem to like me, I doubt a team with the two of us on it would be very functional. And finally, Pira. Oh, Pira, I really don't know what you do or what you're good at. If you wouldn't mind, Maybe you could fill me in? Pira gave a small O oh as she nodded. As Pira spoke, Izuka learned that she's got a similarly varied weapon set to Blake. Her weapons, Milo and Akuo, were a bit of a marvel of having multiple uses at their disposal. They could go from being a sword and shield combo, to being a bolt-action rifle to being a spear that could also serve as a javelin. It gave her multiple weapons with multiple ways of inflicting harm at various ranges. He'd thought the javelin form wouldn't see a lot of use seeing as how that had involved throwing her main weapon away, but Pira assured him she could bring both it and her shield back if they were thrown. She doesn't speak as to how, which is fair. The two of them were not actually on a team. So given that no one knows how initiation was expected to work, it had put her at a disadvantage to tell him anything much. Still, that was a good bit of information. 
He really couldn't think of anything too sophisticated without giving it a lot of thought. But after doing so, he came up with, well, first is Kakin. He's strong, really strong. He remembered all the terrifying blasts that he had observed from his old friend. Probably the single strongest huntsman I know, publicly at least. Tashinori obviously still outclassed him, but Kachin is incredibly strong. With his semblance that can convert chunks of his aura into explosions, he was pretty much always guaranteed to be. And the way he combines it with his weapon shows what how smart he is too. He remembered the first day of class at Birch where Kachin had shown them off. Creating a set of gauntlets that would allow him to focus his semblance into long-range bursts was, in addition to Tashinori, what inspired Emerald Gust. They even double as extremely strong gauntlets for him to swing around in melee range. Any team that has Kakin in it would immediately benefit from the sort of firepower he brings. But he just... Kakin was a leader, Izuku nodded to himself. He remembered the many boys who followed his old friend around, but not necessarily a good one. He thought back to Kachin barking orders and tossing his things at other people. He got people to follow him because he was the best, because he was strong. Even to his friends he could yell and be sour with. Back home that might have been fine because Kakin was at the top, but this was Beacon. He looked at Pira, something itching at the back of his head. Everyone was at the top. He stopped himself. Well, not me, but still. This was a school for the most gifted potential huntsmen and huntresses. I'm not sure Kachin can just act like he did before. He thought about the way Kachin had reacted to every group he'd ever been assigned to. Kakin isn't terribly good at following other people's orders and doesn't much like people who push back against him. He thought of a smoldering notebook that I've kept trying to be a huntsman for so long. Irked him. Either as a leader or as a member of a team, Kakin is going to be an extremely volatile element. No matter how strong he was, that is going to be an issue. Which left him with five. Ruby would be almost totally necessary for any team made up of the people I've met so far. Her sniper scythe just brings too much long-range utility to a fight. That she's apparently got some kind of speed-boosting semblance on top of that means she can dart in and out of a skirmish with a lot of ease. That she's here two years early pretty much guarantees that she knows how to use it which, in combat, would immediately give her a big edge. The fact that she's a sister to Yang, who I'd put in second, just means that they'd synergize well, knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses and getting along pretty well. Yang's a close-up brawler with a weapon similar to mine, so I can fathom her effectiveness in close-range combat. She'd be able to cover for the rest of the team. Weiss is also pretty nice, but I don't know too much about what she can do in a fight. Because she's a Shni, I can only assume it has something to do with dust, which would make her great at mid-range. She could bring a lot of different effects to the field just by throwing around concentrated amounts of dust, and who knows what else she'd be good with. Then there's Blake. Her weapon is insanely multi-purposed, and can pretty much be used at a wide variety of ranges. Ruby definitely beats her out at long range, but Blake can pretty much dip in and out of every other category. She also seems like she's a good person, so she'd be easy to get along with too. Then there's you. Honestly, aside from Ruby, you could fit just about anywhere in here for the same reason that Blake can. The multiple ways your weapon can be used means that at any range outside of Ruby's extremely long range you'd be effective. You just bring a lot of versatility to a lot of situations which no one can really complain about. As much as I'd like to include Kakin, he just doesn't fit so well into a team. Not because he isn't amazing, he is, but, well, he's not a great team player, I think. That's, that's what I think at least. He sheepishly scratched at his cheek as Pira nodded along. Before he finished he notices she seemed to be waiting for something, and, as he concluded, watched as she tilted her head to the side. What about you? What about me? You didn't include yourself anywhere in that little analysis. He blinked slightly as Pira brought this up, his mind quickly going back over his own analysis. Huh, she was right. I didn't include myself anywhere in that. Though, he grinned a bit sheepishly as he looked off a bit the reason why sitting in his head. Well, you asked how I'd put a team together and that's how I'd do it. I tried to put together the best team I could think of and, well, that really didn't include me, I think. He scratched at the back of his head as he said this, which left Pira blinking in some surprise. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the same reason that I could be slotted in for anyone but Ruby could be used to put you in Yang's place, correct? If your weapon set is so similar. He conceded the point, but felt the need to elaborate. I have a pretty good feeling that Yang's gonna be better and stronger than I am. She had the advantage after all. She's probably had an aura for God's knew how long, while he was still playing catch up. Sure, he worked three times harder in order to earn his place, but it still didn't feel like he was there. He knew his wasn't the strongest or the fastest person here. Heck, 
For all he studied and knew about huntsmen, he was fairly certain you weren't the smartest either. Plus, well, he was only here because Tashinori gave him a chance. He said that Izuku deserved one for all, and that he earned it through his hard work and, hey, Tashinori was probably right, but that hadn't made one for all his. And in his mind, that didn't make his place at Beacon here his either. As far as he was concerned until tomorrow, he was here because Tashinori saw potential in him and gave him a chance. Until he passed initiation, this wasn't his place yet. Once he had, well, then he'd have earned his spot here. He'd have made his chance here his own. Then he could work as hard as he could on making himself better and catching up. Until then, well, it still felt like he hadn't quite belonged. If I was going to make a team, I'd want it to be the best it could be. That's the only way we'd be able to keep people safe, is if we have the best people out there saving them and inspiring them. Out of the people I met today, well, I know I'm not the best. So it wouldn't be best served by having me on it. Before Pira could answer his point, he heard a voice ring out over the crowd. Could we all turn down the lights and quiet down? Some of us are trying to sleep. He recognized it as Weiss' voice and, while it sounded a little annoyed, it doesn't sound angry. There seemed to be a general hum of consensus that followed and, soon afterward, Izuku pushed himself up off the floor. Well, I think I need to go ahead and turn in. Nice talking to you, Pira. She looked at him for a few seconds, a bit of a scrunch to her nose as if she had been thinking, before she smiled. Nice speaking with you as well, Izuku. Good evening. With that, he turned in for the night. The next morning had been a bit of a rush for Izuku. Ten months of working on Tashinori's plan had pretty much conditioned him to wake up early and get a head start on his day and, well, considering how much work he still had to go, it seemed prudent to keep up with the routine. So he got up, quietly maneuvered around the students in the main hall so as not to risk waking them, since by the looks of it, it seemed like he was the only one up right then, and quickly changed into his workout clothes. Running had felt a lot different with Aura he realized. He hadn't been a slouch without it. By the end of the ten months he could pretty much sprint for almost a mile before easing into a hard jog. However, after having attained Aura, it felt almost comical that he had ever held that as being a good point for his running. He felt all the energy of the Aura, his, or maybe Tashinori's, soul power through his muscles, keeping them refreshed and from falling to fatigue as he sprinted around campus. He kept at a hard pace in order to try to get some burn out of his morning run and, after a while, he eventually felt it. Eventually he noticed that someone else seemed to be out and running as well. An overweight man with gray hair and a mustache who ran even faster than he was around the campus. Izuka waved and the man waved back, saying something about the boy, putting on a good show, or something like that before sprinting off. The man ended up lapping Izuka several times as eventually his own aura couldn't prevent his muscles from feeling sore. It was a strange and wonderful feeling all wrapped up into one when he felt his aura poured into his aching muscles slowly but surely easing the soreness and helping them rebuild faster and stronger. Man, was this what I've been missing out on all these years? As Izuku came to a stop, finally exhausted after all that running, he was surprised to realize that he'd been at it for a few hours. He heard a message ring out over the intercom system signaling that breakfast had just broken out and, with a bit of a jump, he ran to get himself some food. According to the schedule for the day's events, he realized that it wouldn't be too long after breakfast that they'd all be expected to go out to the meeting place for Beacon's initiation. Izuku decided that it was probably a good idea to grab a quick breakfast and then sneak in a shower before the test proper began. He hadn't wanted to go to the test smelling like a sweaty sock, after all. He grabbed a change of clothes to bring with him to the shower. He'd rather not risk the possibility that there would already be people in the locker room when he was done. Having walked around in just his t-shirt and shorts had been more than enough for him. Walking around in just a towel would have been a step too far. He decided to bring a change of workout clothes, just in case the test included some sort physical activity. As Izuku exited the shower room, dressed in what he had brought and finishing off drying his wild head of green hair, he looked around the locker room and noticed that everyone seemed to be filtering in to get their change of clothes and gear. Thankfully, it seems like most everyone had already changed, be still his beating heart, and it seemed like everyone was going to be taking their weapons just in case. Probably not a bad idea all things considered. Even if the initiation has no use for them, better to be prepared. As he walked along to his locker, he noticed a few groups of people, and some individuals scattered off by themselves, around the locker room. They all had a bit of time before they had to go to the meeting place, so Izuku decided that maybe hanging out wouldn't be a bad idea. He slapped himself on the cheeks a couple of times trying his best to psyche himself up, and found that it didn't really work out all that well. Honestly, he had probably done more harm than good to his own nerves by pointing out what exactly it was he needed to do 
and how he could have messed it all up and how. Okay, that's the point. He shook his head a bit and looked around, trying to decide on who to speak with. He saw a lot of faces that, by then, were familiar and still quite a few that weren't. Not surprising. Considering all the students in the main hall the last evening, it had only made sense that he hadn't exactly had the time to get to know everyone taking the initiation. Still, seeing as how Yang and Ruby seemed to be going through their own issues at that moment, he decided to go look for some folks who were a little more at ease. After a bit, he smiled as he saw Pira and Weiss, the two in a small group with two guys he'd spotted around those past two days. Pira had a polite smile on her face and Weiss had a polite, if slightly excited, grin on her features. As he approached, Izuku took notice of the fact that Weiss' excitement was probably a little more heavy than he initially realized from back where he was standing. Meanwhile, Pira's polite smile, while present, seemed a bit forced. Before he could rethink actually approaching their group, Pira spotted his approach, and her face immediately split into a grin. Oh, Izuku, hello. Good to see you. It was too late to back out at that point. So instead, he just smiled nervously and waved back as he approached the group of four. Weiss seemed surprised by his sudden arrival and the two young men. One of them the blue-haired young man with glasses and the other guy with red and white hair and he suddenly noticed a huge scar over the left side of his face, turned to see his approach. Ah, uh, Miss Nikos, do you know this young man? The guy with glasses opened, readjusting his spectacles as he turned to Izuku before. He didn't even know how to describe what glasses did next. His hand motions and posturing was actually a bit jarring at first as his movements caught Izuku a bit off guard. They hadn't been overly energetic and they were not random but, well, there was a surprising amount of oomph behind each movement. I had assumed that he was a fan that was approaching our conversation in order to bother you. Was I mistaken? He said, having once again started the gesturing. The other guy with the scar just seemed to be watching Izuku carefully as Pira Nikos shook her head. Oh no, not at all. We actually met last night. I can assure you he wouldn't do such a thing. Yeah. He stammered out a bit, caught slightly off guard by the guy's wild gestures. I just saw Pira and Weiss and thought I'd come over, say hi and introduce myself to a couple more people. Sorry if I'm interrupting. You are interrupting a little, but I suppose I've gotten the meat of our discussion out of the way. Weiss responded, seeming a little flustered at first before smiling. We were discussing the possibility of the four of us coming together to form a team. Izuku perked up a bit at that. Oh, that's pretty cool. I imagine you're pretty good with Dustweiss, and from what Piraz told me, she's a really versatile fighter. Indeed, his thoughts from the night before ran through his head. Though, not knowing who the other two are had hampered his ability to judge how they'd fit in. Weiss nodded, a bit amused. I'd say that's underselling Pira Nikos level of skill. After all, she was the Mistral Regional Champion four years in a row. He just kind of stared blankly as he slowly nodded. He tried to not seem like he was brushing off an accomplishment. Winning any kind of championship was probably really impressive, but, well, he didn't actually know what the Mistral Regional was. Having seen the look on his face, Weiss's expression slowly dropped. You can't tell me you don't know what that is or who Pira Nikos is. She said while glancing over to Pira and seeing, well, a very odd expression on her face. For someone who wasn't having either herself or her accomplishments be recognized, she seemed oddly cheerful. He just shrugged at Weiss. She graduated at the top of her class at Sanctum Academy. Oh wow, really? That's really impressive, Pira. Sanctum's supposed to be the top primary combat school in Mistral. Pira nodded, that seeming like an accomplishment she was mildly proud of, before she sheepishly scratched the back of her head. A portion of my grades were helped by those. Tournament wins and the fame that came with them but I did work very hard to accomplish that. Izuka nodded his head as Pira spoke. Why sighed a bit as she nodded. Geez, the only thing you know much about is huntsman stuff, isn't it? The glasses-wearing boy seemed mildly interested by that while the guy with the scar seemed nervous? Maybe not the right word, but he didn't seem eager about that bit of information. I see, very interesting. So you're well informed as to hunters and their craft then? The blue-haired boy spoke with those odd gestures again, but Izuku nodded your head. Yeah, I've made sure to study all of that pretty hard so I could be prepared for when I come to Beacon. The blue-haired young man nodded as he readjusted his glasses, and while he seemed just as mechanical in his mannerisms, his voice had lost any of the animosity that previously existed. I see, a very wise course of actions. Preparation is a very key aspect of being a huntsman, after all. The young man turned his head a bit toward the other young man before looking at Midoriya again. Pardon us, 
We know your name thanks to Miss Nikos, but I haven't introduced myself, and neither has our other acquaintance here. I am Tinya Ida, and this is Shoto Todoroki. The young man spoke for himself before Tinya could step in, seeming a bit bothered with having this bit of information brought forward. Izuka's throat went dry almost immediately as his eyes nearly popped out of their sockets. Okay, not really, but it felt pretty close. Tenya Ida, most likely of the Ida family, the famous group of engineers who over the past several decades have been making strides in Huntsman Tech Up in Atlas, the same family that produced excellent Huntsman, even before the profession was revitalized by Tashinori. And Shoto Todoroki, there was no way, it had to be that, Todoroki if Weiss was making a big deal out of the four of them forming a team. He had to be related to, and most likely the son of, Inji Todoroki, the second greatest hunter currently living. Holy. Hey fanboy, calm down. Don't nerd out on me here. Once more Tashinori's voice rang out in his head, the will of his hero acting as his conscience as it slapped him upside the head mentally, which Izuku had been quick to shake off. Come on, this was way too cool. Two of the most prestigious hunter families in all of Remnant represented here, in your class, at Beacon Academy. That way too awesome. After all, the Ida family. I said knock it OFF. Izuku coughed into his fist as he finally regained his composure. Ah, uh, whoa, that's, that's pretty cool. It's great to meet you both. Despite how hard he had tried to hold himself together, his enthusiasm was readily apparent to them still. Their reactions, however, were probably far more muted than what would have occurred if he did freak out as he had felt incoming. Shoto seemed a bit bothered with being so obviously recognized, and while Tenya had seemed pretty proud of the recognition, but it wasn't as extreme as it might have been. Pira, from her position behind the two, seemed to be nodding at Izuku in approval, a gesture quickly matched by Weishni. It would have been terribly impolite to just suddenly freak out in front of two acquaintances, after all, and not fanboying out had probably left a great deal of pressure off of Shoto's shoulders. All in all, he considered that a success, though it had been becoming increasingly worrisome that somehow Tashinori had become the voice of his conscience. Ten months of following his workout plan to the letter would do that though. After that display, the conversation returned to Weiss' previous topic. At any rate, I assume that you can see now why this team, if made, would be formidable. Between my own combat skills and prowess with Dust and the Shni family semblance, Pira's combat skills and, as you said, versatile weapon set, the Ida genius when it comes to engineering hunter weapons, gear and armor and the pure prowess of the Todoroki line, we'd be an unstoppable force, easily the top of the class here at Beacon. Weiss seemed to realize that she got a little overexcited as she said this as everyone else in the group had given her a slightly odd look. Except for Ida. Indeed. When I had heard this offer from Miss Shni, I too was quite intrigued. A group like this would be a very powerful team of hunters. A lot of good work could be done if we did end up working together. It seemed as though the reason why Tinya hadn't been bothered was because, in his own way, he was excited about the prospect as well, or at least, his gesture seemed excited while his tone of voice maintained its very put-together structure. Though, having looked at Pira and Shoto, he could tell that the former was not exactly as thrilled as the other two were, and that Shoto seemed more annoyed by the repeated mentions of his family. A small frown formed on Izuku's face after realizing this. As Ida said that, Izuku couldn't help but bring his hand up to his lip again, a gesture he himself was starting to recognize as his thinking posture, as he took a moment to consider it. Well, I mean, maybe? Tenya and Shoto seemed a bit surprised by this response before Izuku reached into the suitcase containing his weapons. He pulled out Huntsman Analysis for the future volume 13. At the time his latest, and the one he tried to bring everywhere, just in case he found something new to take notes on, and produced a pencil from one of his pockets. Well, what can you two do? What are your powers and abilities? Weiss, Ida and Shoto all seemed surprised by this gesture, having expected him to just follow up with their family's reputation and coming to an answer. Only Pira seemed to have expected this sort of response, and, from what he could tell, she definitely approved. Ah, yes of course. I suppose it would be odd to not ask that when thinking about our team dynamic. Tenya quickly straightened himself back out as he readjusted his glasses. For myself, well, I follow the Ida model of hunters quite faithfully. I've designed and seen crafted a set of armor that at several points is powered by dust in various ways, as it has been with my brother and our father before him. So on, the main feature are engines placed in the back of the legs that works off of a combination of a combustion engine run on fire, dust in controlled quantities, while keeping a ice dust radiator built in to ensure that it doesn't overheat. Izuku did his best to recall his notes he'd previously taken on Tensei Ida, 
at the time the senior most hunter in that family. As he worked on his notes on Tinya, the group of four leaned over Izuka's shoulder to look at what he had been doing. Tinya and Shoto seemed quite surprised, as does Weiss, while Pira just watched from the back. As ever, Izuku's art itself wasn't great, but it got the point across and the notes he had taken were thorough based on what he knew about the Ida family and what Tinya himself had told him about his skills. You have an aura, right? Any semblance? Tinya shook his head. I'm afraid not. While our family does produce a strong aura, our line hasn't been one favorable to manifesting a semblance. It's why we've made it our focus to enhance our abilities through our armor and technological prowess. Tinya adjusted his glasses after he saw Izuku nod and continue to jot down notes. I semblance. I'm capable of creating it with a very limited amount of dust through my aura. I also have significant control over it. Izuku actually paused in taking his notes, having finished with Tinya's and moved on to getting ready for Shoto, as he raised his head curiously. While Izuku had asked, he'd taken Shoto's silence as him declining to give information. The look he was giving Izuku was a bit odd as he recorded this information, but he didn't look a gift horse in the mouth. Instead, Izuku asked more questions. Ice? Not fire. Shoto seemed to have expected it, but doesn't seem annoyed. I can. It's clear he'd rather not talk about it. Considering Izuku hadn't probed much into Pira either, he just decided to put off a section to the side about how he might have Inji's semblance. Wait, a dual semblance? Wow, that's really lucky. Again, it was as if he expected it though, this time, he didn't seem as nonplussed. He actually did seem rather annoyed. Yeah. That's all that was said as Izuku cautiously went back to his notes. The green-haired huntsman to be asked Shudo for a little bit more detail on how much ice he was able to create and how much dust the process required, which turned out a lot for a little, before finishing off that section of his notes. My goodness, this is quite prodigious. There's even notes here on things I didn't tell you fully about. As Tenya said that, Izuku blushed a bit as he scratched his cheek, his eyes darting away from the suddenly quite enthusiastic young man. Well, given what you said, I thought I could recall some notes I'd taken on Tensei Ida before and use it to supplement. Tenya nodded quite enthusiastically as Izuku said this. Shoto just looked at his own page in the notebook with a bit of interest. Wait, hold on, volume 13? You have 12 other volumes with information like this? Weiss, from her position, had seen the cover of Izuku's notebook as she looked over at him with keen interest. He nodded again as he looked off to the side. Yeah. Growing up, I wasn't exactly Dash fit to be a huntsman in any way, shape, or form because he was broken, the strongest guy or the fastest, but I thought that if I studied hard and especially took note of how other huntsmen did things, what practices worked and what strategies were effective, then maybe I could learn something that'd help me make up for that difference. Still do, in a way. He admitted rather cautiously as, a fine way to prepare yourself for the career of being a hunter. He was a bit surprised when Tinya loudly declared that. Learning as much as you can and attempting to apply the best of that knowledge is a fine way of making sure you're prepared for any situation. It shows a great deal of tenacity and dedication and a strong work ethic. Oh wow, that really got him blushing. He never really heard anyone actually compliment his practice of taking such prodigious notes. He was pretty well scoffed at before. But, again, back then he didn't even have an aura or a semblance, so it made more sense. Still, to get praise. Indeed. You weren't kidding when you said you were working hard to be here. Weiss added approvingly. It was really something else. Anyway, given all of your individual talents, I do think you guys would be a pretty strong team. While Pira's capabilities at way long range would be limited to her bolt action rifle, it would provide you with options at that kind of a distance. She's additionally be able to join Weiss and Shoto at mid range, where your combined abilities with Dust would make for a lot of battlefield control, especially if you two worked in tandem. If Tenya's armor can stand up to a lot of punishment then especially with the mobility those leg engines would give him he would be able to do a lot in close-range skirmishes, along with Pira when using her sword and shield combination. You all wouldn't lack for options, that's for certain. Izuku looked up with a small grin. I really don't do grading that often, you can never tell how a team will work till it's out there because of how individuals may act or react, but I'd say this could easily be a good team. I guess, maybe an 8 or 9 out of 10? I think that is quite the reasonable analysis. Weiss said, clearly pleased with so much thought having been put behind her idea. Still, before she could continue, Pira seemed to step forward a bit. You talk about us as individuals, Izuku, and how we may act or react. How do you mean? He looked at Pira with a bit of an odd expression, frowning slightly as he scratched the side of his head with the pencil he produced. 
Well, I mean what I say. Nothing about your individual skills tells me about how all these abilities would work in tandem. Maybe it'd be as smooth as silk-like with a lot of other beacon teams, or maybe there's something I'm not seeing. Your family's reputations, your skills, and how nice you all are can tell me a lot, but, well, I can only really guess up until I see how you all work as individuals and in a team. I agree. Shoto surprised everyone by speaking up, the half-and-half -half young man staring at Izuku even as he spoke to the rest of the group. Assuming that we'd work well together, or that we'd be formidable just off of reputation and our names alone, assumes a lot based on a little. This is why we have an initiation in the first place, so that our abilities as individuals and their merits can be tested before we're allowed to go on as hunters in training. Weiss seemed about ready to open up her mouth to counter, but she paused. She looked over to Izuku, and he saw a bit of thought pass through her eyes. She sighed a bit as she reaches up to rub at her forehead. Yes, assuming something or going just off someone's family name and reputation perhaps isn't the best way to go about things. Weiss almost seemed sheepish as she said this and Izuku recalled their conversation from the day before. He shrugged it off though. After all, he was pretty much just as excited as she seemed when he realized who Tinya and Shoto were. Hmm, I can see the wisdom in this. Tinya relented as he readjusted his glasses. Perhaps I myself was a bit overeager. An oversight that I shall have to keep an eye out for in the future. Pira nodded in ready agreement. I think that we should focus first on the initiation and just let the chips fall where they may. Before he could give his own two cents, an announcement rang out over the intercom system. Prospective students, noon approaches. Please make your way to the cliffs overlooking the Emerald Forest for your initiation exam. Pira smiled slightly as she closed her nearby locker. Sounds like we were all right to have our gear ready after all. She noted as the rest of the group nodded in agreement. As they made to depart, Izuku informed them, and the rest of the acquaintances he had made, that he would be at the cliffs shortly as soon as he put on his own weapons. As the room emptied out, it allowed him a moment to think. For all this talk of teams and how they would be organized, he hadn't given too much serious thought to how he would want his own team put together. He had said that he'd be fine with anyone who was nice and he could get along with, but, well, surely it'd be nice to be on a team with people he knew? Or who knows? Maybe the excitement of being around whole new folks appealed would appeal to him. After all, that's part of why he was at Beacon. To reinvent himself. To make himself the sort of person who could be a hero like Tashinori. To be the kind of person he always dreamed. A huntsman that could save people and inspire them with a smile on his face. He was ripped from these thoughts as he realized he had been daydreaming. He needed to hurry if he was going to make it to the cliffs on time. Okay. Okay, K. Deep breaths, Izuku. You got this. Today, today's the day. You're finally going to be a huntsman. In training, sure, but a huntsman. This is it. All you have to do is pass whatever test this is, and you'll be a hero. He slapped himself to try and steady his nerves as he stood on a rather odd-looking platform. When he and his fellow students had made their way out of the main Beacon campus and out towards the cliffs overlooking the Emerald Forest, he hadn't quite known what to expect. It had become more and more clear that the initiation would involve no exam such that he took in combat school, and instead would be some kind of practical exercise. This had made him a wee bit nervous, considering the fact that he only actually had his aura unlocked and one for all given to him a couple days ago, but still, that didn't matter. If this was what he needed to do, he'd do it. This wouldn't be enough to make him nervous on its own. What was enough was the fact that he and several other students were now lined up in front of Ashpin and Glinda Goodwitch, the pair of seasoned hunters evaluating all of them, while Izuku and his fellow students stood on slightly elevated platforms, almost like marble statues being evaluated by two collectors of fine art. Glinda. She seemed conflicted when she saw Izuku. She sent some kind of harsh look Ashbin's way before returning a look to Izuku, while still colored by her stoic nature, seemed oddly sympathetic. Ashbin, on the other hand, just looked Izuku over, offering a small smile, before moving on. It was weird and it threatened to send his knees shaking again, but Izuka managed to lock them into place. Finally, Ashbin and Glinda stopped in the middle of the pack of students, still looking over all of the students, before Ashbin spoke up. For years, all of you have been training to become warriors, and today your abilities will be evaluated in the Emerald Forest. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard rumors about the assignment of teams. Glinda followed the headmaster of the academy, a tablet held in her arm as she scanned the small crowd of students. Well, allow us to put an end to your confusion. Each of you will be given teammates, today. Well, okay. That really wasn't unexpected, he guessed. I mean, 
It had been fairly clear that all of them would be getting partners and teammates once they passed initiation. Yeah, he didn't really see what's to be worried. These teammates will be with you for the rest of your time here at Beacon. So it is in your best interest to be paired with someone with whom you work well. Ashbin took a slow sip of his coffee upon saying this, before he turned his attention back to them all. That being said, the next person you make eye contact with after landing will be your partner for the next four years. What? Surprisingly, Izuku had not been the only one to shout that out of surprise. Quite a few other students, including, he'd wager a guess, Ruby Rose, seemed to share his misgivings. He could faintly hear Pira mutter, Well, what do you know? It is random. Somewhere down the line, while another girl told someone that she knew it all along. That. That is how the Great Beacon Academy chooses partner pairs? That's even worse than it just being random. So what? If you just so happened to land next to someone you wouldn't get along well with, you were just doomed to have a bad time here at Beacon. Nervously, he looked down the line and spotted Kaken. And Kaken spotted him too. If Kachin could have made Izuku explode, Izuku was fairly certain he would have. He quickly decided to stop looking at him and looked back toward Ashbin. After you partner up, make your way to the northern end of the forest. You will meet opposition along the way. Now, while you will be monitored and graded along the way, the goal of your initiation is to find an abandoned temple at the end of your path. Within it are several relics. Each partner pair must choose one, guard it, and return to the top of the cliff with it to successfully pass initiation. As such, you aren't being graded on the number of grim you can kill. Destroy what stands in your way of course, they will kill you if you don't, the matter-of-fact way Ajbin said that caused a nervous lump to form in Midoriya's throat. But don't let yourselves get bogged down. The Emerald Forest is quite large and dangerous, and you do have a time limit. Ashbin twirled his cane around and pointed it to the sun, set high in the sky above them. Currently, it is noon. At sundown, the test will conclude. Students who remain within the forest, relics in hand or not, will fail Beacon's examination. Instructors will not interfere in the exam and will only enter the forest once night has fallen to collect wayward students. Now, are there any questions? Any questions? Izuku first asked in his mind, then screamed silently, Any questions? Why is your school being run like this? How do you not have massive lawsuits from parents year after year because of this? Has anyone actually died? Are you being serious? Holy woe, were Tashinori and Enji really just blind luck? How are we all expected to get down the click click clunk? Izuku was pulled from his mild panic attack by an unusual sound. He looked around for the origin of it and looked down to his left, where he saw one of the platforms fling itself up to the sky and the student who had been standing on its sail into the forest. He just stared at it for a moment, processing what he just saw. Oh, he just stared. Oh, well, that was one question answered, at least. What? I'd suggest you come up with your landing strategy quick, young man. You are coming up very soon. Izuku turned his gaze over to Ajbin as he heard platform after platform launch student after student into the Emerald Forest. Okay. Okay. He slammed his palms onto his cheeks, trying to reorient himself. You can do this. You can totally do this. Just, just calm down and think. After a moment, he felt the panic. Will not die, but at least subside. Huntsmen and huntresses do this kind of stuff all the time. Heck. You did a whole lot of physical activity in combat school to prep for situations like these. Granted they took it easy on you because hey, no aura, but still. You just, just need to calm down and think. The world seemed to disappear, and for a second, he was back in control. Okay. It's okay. There's no need to panic. There's no need to panic. There's no need to dash. Click click. Panic. Now is the time to dash. Clunk. A E H H H H. Izuku was immediately sent flying through the air and all thoughts scattered from his mind. He had had numerous drills in combat school, but none had ever been this intense. Part of that was, he knew, not wanting to kill students but the other part was that he hadn't been able to handle it in his previous state. Something like this would have cracked him open like an egg. Now here he was, his second day with Aura and attempting to get into Beacon, and he was soaring through the air like a bullet. He barely even had time to fully comprehend just how fast he was going up and out before he hit the peak of his arc. Slowed down a bit. I don't think I was this high off the ground when I was on the airship, he observed, almost enjoying the weightlessness. And then promptly began falling down that same arc toward the ground. As he looked through the air, he spotted numerous fellow prospective students around him, all employing various strategies to soften their fall and hit the ground safely. And yet for all of that, he couldn't see how he could possibly slow down his own fall. He gripped his fist, 
not really wanting to wast. Crack K.O.W. An all too familiar sound dragged him out of his panic and forced him to spin in the air to try and get a good look at it. After a couple failed attempts, he saw it. Yang Xiaolong had been falling towards the ground and, unlike him, did nothing to slow her momentum no, she was practically skydiving toward the ground, and then he saw what the sound was before. Rearing her fists back, Yang fired out her shotgun bracers too. Izuku's green eyes immediately went wide in realization. She was using the recoil from her shotgun blasts in order to affect her momentum in the air and change her direction on the fly, slowing herself down and making sure she was on course to land where she wanted. He immediately reached around his body, tripping the safeties on all four of his shotguns as he punched and kicked out in midair, mecha shifting the mechanisms and shotguns into place as he did so. All right. So, so maybe I've never done this before. Maybe someone else has more experience with it, but I'm pretty good with a shotgun myself thanks to my training. And Yang just showed him how to use these. I can do this. The first two shots were almost experimental. He threw his fists out in front, if him in the hope that it would at least stop his spinning and let him actually think for a moment. One arm flailed uselessly to the side as it almost sent him sideways, but his other managed to do what he wanted, somewhat. Deciding that he had four shotguns for a reason, he decided to kick out both feet next. The shotgun mechanism triggered early on one, which threatened to send him tumbling head over heels again but his other shot fired true. His momentum and spin was reduced as he managed to kick out right in front of his trajectory arc, which pushed him away from it. It wouldn't be long before simple gravity put him right back at that speed so he kept going. For going going one limb at a time that point, Izuku took careful aim and fired out all four of his limbs at once. His right arm was a bit off but the rest of his shots more than made up for it, slowing him down and softening his trajectory even further. Finally, with a great yell, he pulled back both his arms and both legs and threw them forward with a great deal of force. All four shotguns went off simultaneously in the same direction and, that time, he could actually stop to feel what exactly he'd accomplished. He had managed to slow his momentum tremendously, but he was still falling pretty fast. If he were to hit the ground like that maybe, just maybe, with a good roll in his aura he'd be able to absorb the hit without actually hurting himself but, before he could give that more thought, a whistling sound hit his ear. Looking toward the source, his eyes immediately went wide when he saw, out of nowhere, holy whoa, where is that javelin coming from? He almost panicked and tried to throw himself through the air to avoid it before a thought hit him. The spear and its color scheme, it, operating more on gut instinct than on rational thought, probably a result of all the adrenaline running through him at that moment, Izuku reached and grabbed for the spear. Perhaps if he could just grasp the shaft, he caught it, and then found himself being pulled along by the spear's momentum and its trajectory rather than his own. He'd been a lot closer to the tree line than he had been at the top of his arc, and, looking forward, he could see that the spear was carrying him toward a tree. If I'm right, he thought, and Pira did throw this. Her intention was probably to help out by interrupting the fall to the ground and securing me to the tree. He gritted his teeth as he tensed his body to absorb the upcoming shock of the stop as he heard the spear impact against the tree with a mighty thud. Izuka hadn't even really felt it all that much in the end. His green eyes cracked open cautiously as he looked around and, before he knew it, a wide smile had plastered itself on his face. He was hanging from Pira's spear, itself embedded in the tree quite firmly, just a couple dozen feet off the ground. He hadn't totally landed yet, but, but, I did it. He allowed yourself a minor celebration as he shouted out, almost delirious laughter ringing out as he hung from the spear. Looking out in the vague direction he thought the spear had come from, he shouted as best as he could, Thank you. I'm sorry. No, really thank you. He looked down to the ground and take a breath. Now all there was to do was climb down. At this point he was kind of wishing he'd actually done a bit more of that, but hey, how hard could it be to climb down a normal tree? Before Izuka did so, he stopped, pondered there for a moment, then slapped his forehead before reactivating the safeties on his gauntlets and boots. Trying to climb this thing would be for nothing if a wrong move triggered his shots and blew him off, after all. He wrapped his legs around the trunk of the tree as best as he could and secured his hand. As soon as he let go of the spear to try and see if he had a secure grip his smile widened. He in fact did have a secure grip. He reached a hand up and grabbed Pira's spear and, after a bit of a struggle, he managed to pop it out of the tree. The additional weight had almost ended up ripping him from his tenuous grip on the tree, but he let the weapon fall to the ground before it did. The spear managed to land tip first and firmly root itself, 
the drop having not been that far at all for something so sturdy. With that, he set about climbing down the tree with little rush. It hadn't been that far down to the ground, and it wasn't long before he touched the ground. Izuku resisted the urge to lean over and kiss the ground after his harrowing journey through the air. But the urge was there. Okay, he thought as he began to step away from the tree. I'll find Pira and return her spear. Even if she has her own part dash. Giarar. He heard it was the only reason, he thought, that he ended up knowing something was coming for him. He gulped as the sound began to get louder knowing from months of study exactly what that rather distinctive canine tone meant. He turned around and saw them. Three Bia wolves. They must have followed the sounds I made, Izuku almost felt like swearing. The three slowly stalked about him as all three glared hatefully with their glowing, red eyes. A breath caught in his throat. So this is it. He felt his fist tighten. Aside from that fateful day. I've never actually seen a grim up close like this before. This... This is going to be my first fight against them. And, to his own surprise, he felt his spine harden to steel. My first real chance to show that I can be a huntsman. Izuku slowly, so as not to cause them to immediately charge at him, tripped the safeties on his shotguns before getting into a crouch, bringing his fists up into his stance as he stared each of the three monsters dead in the eyes. In the peripheral of his vision, he could tell he was deep in the emerald forest. A tree was to his back and several others surrounded this small clearing. He clenched and unclenched his fists, taking a deep breath. It was barely noticeable, but it was there. He was faster than them. His training with Tashinori has at least ensured that. Still, he was outnumbered, and while Bia Wolves might not be the strongest Grim, they were still Grim. They were still deadly. He took a deep breath as he wriggled his fingers in his gauntlets, a plan forming in his mind. There was no need to rush for them. They would come to you. He tensed his body up, keeping his back to the tree to keep the grim from trying to swarm him. His right arm was cocked and ready to go, ready to punch the first grim that got close enough for him to do so. He didn't have to wait long. Young grim and young bio wolves especially have never been known for their patience. The trio of grim charged, claws at the ready as they dashed and looked to tear him to ribbons. He took a long, steadying breath as they approached. I can do this. I've been training your entire life for this. Looked forward his eyes clear, this is my dream. Aoag. With those thoughts in mind, Izuku roared with a mighty yell, fierce enough to match the howls of the Bio wolves, as he reared a fist back and launched it forward. His aim was true, and while the Beowulf attempted to sidestep at mid-charge, the beast's dodge was for naught as Izuku's fist collided with the center of its mass. The Beowulf was stopped near dead in its track as, with that motion, the shotgun in his arm triggered sending a blast of pellets into the form of the Grim. Despite the directness of the hit, it did not actually seem all that effective. But Izuku was not surprised. Weapons like guns were meant to cause grievous injury by piercing the skin and hitting vital organs, something the Grim hadn't possessed. His shotgun pellets, while dangerous, didn't inflict the damage they could on a normal target. Still, they were capable of doing more than he was on his own, so it would have to be enough for now. The Bio Wolves growled as they attempted to attack him back. The first, having been struck by his attack, missed wildly, the force of the blow having knocked it off balance. The third also misses, Izuku's move to attack its brethren having dodged him out of the arc of its attack. The second wolf, however, aimed its strike true and, despite Izuku's best attempt, Izuku couldn't dodge while he was so far extended. It struck him across the side and he almost made to scream in pain, but didn't. He could practically feel it. He could feel his soul reach out to defend him from the blow, both entirely rebuffing some of the hit and then absorbing the rest. He felt just the slightest bit more winded from it, but there was no pain. So this is what it means to have aura, he thought, and for a second, a slight giddiness appeared in his heart. Still, having aura wouldn't have meant anything if they keep getting hits on him. He had to put them down. He refused to die here. He once again reared back his fist and launched it forward aiming a blow at the Beowulf he'd already damaged. The Grim tried to dodge again, but it just couldn't avoid the hit as Izuku pounded his fist into its chest, the shotgun once again roaring aloud as it fired right into the Grim. Izuku saw the monstrous Beowulf stumble for a moment before it fell onto its back. Unnatural as they are, enough punishment could even force a Grim to black out under the right amount of pressure. Izuku saw something in the other two Beowulf's eyes. A glint of an emotion. Anger? Fury? Frustration? It was hard to tell with the Grim. But one thing he knew for certain was that they both reared back, roared, 
and came at him with a sudden ferocity he hadn't been expecting. They attacked at once, and while he tried to dodge one of their blows, its claws dug into his aura again, far more violently than it had previously. He gritted his teeth as he felt further exhausted from the hit, but he kept his focus. As the other Grimm brought its paw around to strike at Izuku, he slapped it away at the last second, the attack going off to the side as he found yourself within the Grimm's guard. The brawl. For that's all this fight between a young inexperienced graduate of a combat school and three juvenile Grimm could hope to be, raged on, the force of Izuku's yells and the howls of the Grimm lightly echoing through the nearby forest forest. Fists flew and claws attempted to slice into flesh as the battle continued. Izuku's next punch missed its mark completely, and it cost him dearly. The Grimm counterattack and reached down to rip at him. His aura offers what protection it can and, thankfully, one of the Grimm claws barely manages to scratch it, while the other did significant harm. Izuku felt like half his strength from the beginning of the fight had been sapped, but he kept powering on regardless. He couldn't let them get to him. He had to hit them where it hurt. The next two seconds were a blur, a whirling vortex of fur, fists, claws, and his sweat as he danced around the Grimm and they danced around him. He managed to pull his head out of wherever it had been the previous second and connected his first punch into the second Beowulf. It howled loudly, even he was able to tell he did a lot there. For a moment, it even looked like it would collapse back with its brethren. But the monster persevered and came back to try to attack him. It almost did, but he parried its blow, sending its claw careening into that of its brothers, which caused it to miss Izuku wildly. Not messing around, he went in for another blow, and found that it too hit true. That time the Grim didn't merely collapse into unconsciousness. The fist tore through its torso, and it began to dissolve. The, the first Grim he'd ever killed. The first Grim he had ever killed. He'd done it. He didn't have time to think on that as the third Beowulf immediately turned on him to try and strike him. He, however, managed to slap its paw away once again, grinding his teeth together as he prepared for the next flurry of blows. He stopped though. He had run out of shotgun shells in his gauntlets. However, that thought was only a momentary distraction. If he couldn't hit it from there, then he would just have to hit it with his legs. Perhaps it was the fact that it was the last of the three that had come for him. Perhaps it was just the innate hatred that all Grimm had for humanity. But he swore, looking into that last Beowulf's eyes, he saw a searing, maddening hatred for him. It was going to kill him. If it was the last thing that monster ever did, it would kill him. Boy, did it try. The first row of attacks was just a trade-off. He had struck the Beowulf and it had struck back. He pounded it in the chest for damage that would have seriously harmed or injured most creatures. But this monster just took it. He felt its claws attempt to cut into his shoulder, and, once more, his aura was there to protect him. However, he felt like you were on some sort of brink. He was only just barely on the edge of exhaustion. If he took another hit, it wouldn't just be more of his aura gone. It would leave his ability to continue the fight seriously limited. That fight had to end without this Beowulf being allowed to get another attack on him. He moved in again, and once more, his kick was aimed true as he struck the Beowulf in the torso. He watched it stumble, and he hoped beyond hope that that could be it, that the fight didn't have to drag on. A guttural, angry roar told him otherwise as the Beowulf, seemingly filled with new energy, dived at him. He rapidly brought his leg back and sent his forearm up into the paw of the Beowulf, knocking its claws away. He kicked again, but it was off by the tiniest margins. He grunted through his teeth as he managed to flow through the kick, landing back on his feet in time to parry the next blow of the Grim. He was gasping for breath then as he stared this monster in the face. He reared his leg back and, with a mighty blow, sent it crashing into the Grimm's chest, the roar of the shotgun in the boot soon following. A hole blew open in the body of the Grimm, and both Izuku's and its eyes went wide. It stared at him, as if in utter disbelief, before it slowly but surely melted away. He was taking deep, rasping breaths as he stumbled around, his body feeling numb after the exertion he put it through. He realized that he was missing one, of course. It wouldn't do to leave a Grim around, even an unconscious one. Without much thought, he stomped his boot into the Grim's head, the blast of the shotgun taking care of it as the Grim's body rapidly dissolved. He actually chuckled a bit. That was the last bit of ammo in his boots and gloves. He would have to reload. He had to reload. Because he had done it. He'd done it. He'd done it. He killed three Grim by himself. He collapsed back against the trunk of the tree he had managed to hit with Pira's spear and slowly slid down it, 
an almost delirious smile on his face as he looked at the dissolving bodies of the Grimm. He could feel a rush of emotions hit him all at once. It, it was an accomplishment. This was the work he dreamed of doing. Being a huntsman. A hero. And there, just then, he proved he could do it. Maybe nobody else saw him. Maybe no one else could congratulate him for what he did. Maybe he really didn't prove to anyone that he could be the person he dreamed of. But there and then, he proved it to himself. He really could do it. He could be a hero. He felt the sting of tears in the corners of his eyes as he tried to compose himself. In that moment, he didn't even notice as the spear began to shake and shimmy on the ground before it floated up. He only really noticed when the spear flew up and away from him, into the hands of, well, for someone who sold themselves so low in their own team placements, it seems you can take care of Grimm by yourself quite well. The bright green eyes of Piranikos met his own as she smiled kindly and approvingly at him. And for the first time he could remember he heard a classmate regard him with pride. Partner. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.